everyone, and welcome to the Culture Cast. I'm Chris Stashew, and I am joined by the one and only Mr. Pipes, Eric Niss. <laughs> Every time you do one of these openings, I always forget that it's going to happen, and then it happens, and I'm caught off guard, and I don't know what to say. <laughs> oh God, look at him. He's in the reflection. I saw his face. The cat scratched oh out his eyes. Oh, jeez. And uh, we are also joined by the host of the award-winning, world-renowned Projection Booth podcast, the one and only Mr. Mike White. Wow, this is definitely fiction. (laughs) (laughs) This is real? (laughs) Uh, The lines are are lighting up. They're calling in to tell us it's all a lie. (laughs) He's really really bringing us up is what's happening. We need to have you on more often. I'm bringing you guys up with the power of positivity. And uh, so we are continuing Horrortober with a look at the critically acclaimed, controversial, not here, but overseas, 1992's Ghostwatch. On Saturday night, we'll be visiting the most haunted house in Britain. But will the ghosts be there? Can you take it? Ghostwatch, a Screen One special for Halloween, Saturday at 9.25 on One. Ghostwatch was created and written by Stephen Volk, directed by Leslie Manning. It stars playing themselves, for the most part, Michael Parkinson, Sarah Green, Mike Smith, Craig Charles, and Gillian Bevan playing Dr. Lynn Pass. Ghostwatch centers around a, a, a mockumentary found footage reality horror TV program where Michael Parkinson, who is was very big in Britain at the time, he's like a, he's a TV show host, had a uh, team go out to a haunted house, and he hosted it from the studio with a parapsychologist played by Gillian Bevan. So, Mike, kicking it to you, I know you had never seen it, but I know you would wanted to see it, so what did you think of Ghostwatch? I thought it was very effective. I really enjoyed it. There are a lot of moments where I was very tense and um, wasn't necessarily scared, but uh, was very tense. Um, I found the pacing to be very interesting, and I felt kind of bad because going back and reading the trivia notes about the movie, they said that you could actually see Pipes, the creature in this. I never saw anything, so I feel kind of like a dumbass. Well, the first time I watched it, I didn't catch it either. So I don't, I, I, you're not alone by any account. So I am curious though, Eric, the first time you watched it, did you see the ghost at all? Um, I saw, uh, there's the one like shot where they go and they're in the girl's bedroom or whatever. And you can see like, uh, pipes is standing there in the curtains, but like they have him colored exactly the same as the curtains. Um, and they do like, he's just like sweeping out of the room, like he's leaving and you just see this person standing there up against the curtains and then he like goes back and there's nothing there anymore um but i did there's like the one shot where like you could see his face and stuff and it took i had to go back and find it afterwards yeah the one that i really like again i didn't see it the first time i watched it but the one that i think is the most effective for me is at 30 minutes in 30 seconds where you see him behind them in the studio when they're playing the possessed voice and the studio goes dim and then the like and you can kind of see a face in the background and the studio lights back up and no one's there i thought that that was really effective um i do agree with mike though this is a really it's an interesting piece of kind of entertainment because it's found footage kind of I mean, it is found footage, but it's also very much a mockumentary. So it kind of straddles the line, which we talked about with the conspiracy. Let me redo that. We talked about with the conspiracy. When these found footage horror films kind of tread two lines or really go after two different styles, that's when they're more interesting rather than just, oh, this is just a camera that we found in the woods. Where did the kids go? Or we set up a camera in our bedroom. Look out for the scary ghost. And so that's what I think one of the most effective things about Ghost Watch is, is it mixes the medium to try and create a sense of realism that a lot of things kind of don't go after right off the bat. No, yeah, I agree. Um, it's, I really like the formatting of it and I really like the pacing of it, um, because they take so long to get to like the stuff that actually happens. It really makes it more believable. Like it feels like a real broadcast for the whole first, like 
hour of it like it would just be like i don't know like any other one of these like style shows from the early 90s you know it could have been uh, unsolved mysteries like just like the british version um you know it's uh it's very believable the way that they have it set up um with the you know the tv crew and everything like that and then i mean the ending gets like a little bit hokey but i mean i you know for the time or whatever and uh it's uh, it's I don't know it's cool it's it's interesting and it's totally different than anything I've ever seen which is amazing and I'm sort of surprised that like nobody's tried to like ape this format in the last like 30 years well there are things like a uh, special bulletin where it takes place when there's a nuclear strike and it was right around that time of like the day after and threads and these like threats of nuclear war and that was shot like it was a TV broadcast but not this kind of thing like this whole idea of the ghost hunting and all this stuff i think this is really super effective it, as i was watching this movie i kept thinking of the night when they did they um Geraldo, uh went into al capone's vault that like huge build up to absolutely nothing and it was just like one of the biggest jokes to ever happen and i'm surprised that the guy ever managed to maintain his position in the industry after that because it was just (laughs) such a laugh and this is could have gone that way obviously if this was like a real thing and they never saw any ghosts or anything spooky it kind of reminds me of the few and i mean very few ghost hunter shows that i've seen where it's all this like horse shit of oh i heard a noise oh there's definitely presence in here and this kind of stuff oh he's going after zach bagans guys (laughs) zach bagans you're on fucking blast but luckily, something actually happens here, and I like that they they set it up like a narrative at times, like, oh, here's this infrared camera, and here's this thing, and here's this thing, and that they work those back in, I mean, which is pretty typical, right? Like, oh, I'll see that again in the third act, but it's nice the way that they introduce these things as part of the broadcast. And the thing about it, obviously, is watching it, you know, in 2018 or when I saw it last year in 2017, you know, it's 25 years removed from when this was aired in, in, in the UK. And, you know, if you don't know a lot about Ghostwatch, Ghostwatch aired one time and that's it. Because what ended up happening was people didn't catch the beginning of it or didn't realize that it was a narrative and they thought it was real, similarly to the War of the Worlds broadcast by Orson Welles. And... They were calling into the number because, of course, they put a number on the screen. Again, stroke of genius. Absolute stroke of genius. And, you know, it blew up the phone lines. There were people in the newspaper the next day. The newspapers were covering it. Everyone was pissed. And and BBC never showed it again because it was such a controversial piece of entertainment. And, you know... To, I can only imagine what that must have been like to watch it live because watching it now it's it's different there's a you we we appreciate it in a different way than than they would have and then they did but it is it's still absolutely one of the best made like found footage horror films I've ever seen because it it takes an idea and fully commits to it and again Eric I mean I, I can understand Eric at the ending maybe not being a huge fan of it, but imagine watching it and that ending being what the last thing you saw and not being aware that that's not real. Yeah. Right. Oh, I'm, it would freak me the fuck out. If I was watching it, I'd be like, holy shit, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. And again, I think that that's, that's the success of this is you really kind of have to, it can be enjoyed outside of kind of putting yourself in the mindset of someone in 1992, but at the same time, like if you view it from that lens, it, this just becomes that much more kind of impactful because there were people that were scared shitless watching this. There were also people that knew it was fake from the get go, but there were people that thought that this was real. And that's because you didn't have actors playing characters. You had Michael Parkinson playing himself, Sarah Green playing herself. And obviously for a lot of Americans, most Americans, we don't really have any frame of reference as to who Michael Parkinson is. But I would say what is what's an American analog for Michael Parkinson like Stephen uh not Stephen King, um oh, Larry King. Larry King, Tom Brokaw. 
you know, any of your, you know, um, your, your trusted news sources, I would imagine. Yeah. And so that's what makes this so effective is that it does kind of fully commit to this, this kind of the story that they're telling. Yeah. And even when it comes to the people who aren't the TV personalities, when it comes to us watching this as Americans, like, I don't know who these British personalities are necessarily. Like, I know some British TV hosts, but I didn't know these folks. And I just, you know, like, I was catching jokes like, oh, this guy looks like Aid Edmondson, those kind of things. And like, okay, I know who that is. I can get some of these Britishisms here. But even when it comes to the people that are professional actors, like our parapsychologists, it's like, okay, yeah, I don't know who this woman is. Uh, so I, if I, I've seen her in other things, I know that I have by looking up her filmography, but I didn't recognize her right out the, of the gate. So she seemed as legitimate as anyone else in this, as did the kids, as did the mom. So everybody felt like they were real people because the real people were playing it straight and the actors were playing it so, so well that it, that it really carried through. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Every buddy in this felt believable like i didn't i don't think there was like a weak chain in any of the acting or anything like that like even not knowing who these people are like everything felt real even though i knew that it was fake going in everything still felt believable um yeah well and that's the thing about it that's so crazy right is that it's 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 i don't know we have talked already about found footage films this month and we really have picked out some of the better ones because again as much as i know that blair witch is an important film i I don't think it's aged particularly well and i'm not a huge fan of it i know we've already talked about this but this came before blair witch oh and it seemed to be a definite influence on blair witch just so many of these like the little scares the little touches that they're putting in i mean i would be very surprised if the makers of blair witch hadn't seen this before and i remember it being available on dvd uh, maybe mid 90s being importable so it is possible well and that's one of the things the one of the directors of the blair witch project said we had never seen ghost watch before we made blair witch yeah mm. right i'm not sure i i'm not sure i believe that i mean look you could also just skirt the subject and say well blair witch was inspired by cannibal holocaust because I mean, that was also a, a, a big influence on Blair Witch, but I mean, Ghost Watch is one of those things that really stands alone. I can't really, I mean, you can look at like TV programs, but again, like you mentioned, Mike, I mean, this is not reality. This is scripted reality. And so like the thing with Geraldo, where he goes in and there's nothing and oops, a egg on Geraldo's face end of story because there is no story because reality is not nearly as interesting as scripted fic uh, like scripted reality that's that's it's this weird spot where i would love to see something like this again but i think that we're like the time has passed Mm. for something like this to ever work again right when we always complain about like oh we only had so many channels growing up but we forget that Britain had very few channels. And so this playing on BBC One as opposed to BBC Four was such a big deal because BBC One was like the trusted source for all this. Whereas BBC Four was more like, oh, the experimental type of thing. And we they probably could have gotten away with it without this being a national furor, furor on BBC Four. But with this on the channel on BBC One, it was such a scandal. And, you know, we were talking a few months ago on the show about um, on the projection booth about um, just the approach for British TV versus American TV, especially when it comes to entertainment and the idea of wanting or being able to scare the hell out of people, especially when it came to kids. Like, British TV is so much... British TV shows for kids are just so much scarier than American TV for kids. And I would love to see more of their adult-themed horror stuff because this... You know, they were surprised that kids were up at nine o'clock watching television. Surprise, surprise. Um, But if this was more adult themed, I can't even imagine what other adult themed horror stuff that they might have been showing on the BBC at this time, because this was so scary. Um, 
but yeah, and again, in that subtle way, like they really just drag this out, but to a perfect degree. It doesn't, it isn't one of those things where I was just frustrated watching this. I was riveted watching this. Well, and it's one of those things where, like you've mentioned, and like both you and Eric have mentioned, with the length of it and kind of one half of it or half of it being set up. I mean, half of this, it's an hour and a half long. 45 minutes is set up. And it works in its favor because there is a there is a payoff. The payoff feels completely earned. And again, it's also, you know, one of those things where when you watch it the second time around or third or fourth or fifth, you do see the ghost or you pick up on other stuff because the, the first time you watch it, it's kind of jarring. It's the, you know, things just start happening and, you know, it, it seems to be pretty fast paced in the last half and there's a lot of stuff going on. You know, the characters are getting knocked around, some of the characters disappear, some of the characters die, and one of the characters ends up, you know, who knows what happens at the end, gets possessed, and so everything kind of happens really quickly at the end, but the more times, I mean, I've seen it a fair amount of times now, you know, the more times you watch it, the more stuff you pick up on, and it's just the nuances of it are really what sell it, but the first time you watch it, the nuance, you don't really pick up on the nuances, but you're kind of, you're cognizant of them because it's just, this is the way TV is filmed and that's kind of what is being ingrained in us regardless of the culture it's the way tv is filmed and that's what they get so right and much to their success they get that so right so i, I do want to talk a little bit about that there is a documentary out there um ghost watch behind the curtains and they, they talk a little bit about the making of this and kind of the 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 fervor that ended up like mike said that ended up coming out of this I find it funny that they they weren't sure if they wanted to put, you know, created by Stephen Volk at the beginning until they were essentially forced to by the BBC because they were really worried that this was going to be War of the Worlds. And I find that I find that pretty funny. The version that I saw I mean, I I rewatched it again tonight before we started recording and it just said like Michael Parkinson in Ghost Watch. I, there were no opening credits to this. And I was like, okay, I can kind of see if this was how it started, I can kind of see why there was a problem with it. I mean, there are end credits to it. So I was like, okay, this makes sense. But that was that thing where you don't know it's a joke until the end of it. So I don't know. I, what was the your guys' version like? Did they have the created by Stephen Volk on there? Yeah, the one on Shudder did. Okay. Maybe in the end credits, but not in the beginning. I sure thought in mine at the beginning it said created by Stephen Volk. I don't know. There's nothing. I don't think there's anything in the beginning. Because the Shudder one is the one that I watched. Or maybe I'm remembering it incorrectly. I sure thought that it it has something to that effect where it's like created by. Uh, but again, like they did that. They did that because they were worried. Mm-hmm. That, that what happened was going to happen and what they were worried about happening did happen, obviously. Which, again, I mean, I, I'm and, and, you know, this is something that I've kind of grappled with when when talking about and thinking about Ghostwatch is was that something that was important for it to be successful, that it really get the the public's kind of like the public fervor? Would, I mean, in your mind, Mike, was that was that important? I think so. For this to be successful? Yeah, I, I mean... <sighs> I think that we would still be talking about it as far as, yeah, there was this show. Yeah, it says, yeah, it says at the beginning, it says, by Stephen. Hmm. Yeah, but it doesn't. That's not like. I mean, <laughs> I mean, come on. That is a pretty clear sign that someone wrote it, right? I don't think it's overt enough. I think we'd still be talking about this as far as like, hey, there is this show that scared a bunch of people, you know, back in the early 90s. But that it scared a bunch of people with a capital B and people thought it was real and then it enters into being almost like an urban legend kind of thing. I think that's the notoriety that they needed to really push them over because otherwise this might have been just a one night television event and 
we wouldn't really still be talking about it. Well, and they, they talk about that in that Behind the Curtains documentary. Uh, one of the film critics is like, does anyone remember what was aired the week before? Right. Or the week after on BBC? And no, because this is one of those things. This is just one of those things that's become, like you said, Kind of like the, you know, a BBC boogeyman. It's one of those things where it's a, you know, it's an urban legend. Should you see Ghost Watch? Or, I mean, even in 2016, two years ago, people were still finding the pipes apparitions in the film. It's two years ago. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, I'd be interested, like, now that we're talking about it, like, I don't know. Now I... I it makes me this movie is one of those movies where this just watching this movie made me want to watch this movie again. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's like a total testament to its effectiveness and its uniqueness. Um, and the fact that there are pipes, ghosts hidden all over the movie in the background and shit is awesome and super great writing. And I'm sure like during the live broadcast, like some people saw some of those and it freaked them out. <laughs> Or, you know, or maybe just like the subconscious, you know, like part of your brain, like where you can see it, but you don't really know that it's there. So you don't really see it, see it, you know, maybe that makes the ending more effective or whatever. And like I said, like, you know, parts of the ending to me were pretty hokey, um, you know, with the cats and all of that stuff. But like, I, I still get it and it still fits with the story and it still fits with the theme um, and everything that's going on. So, you know, a creative choice that was made is, you know, I don't think it's something that would work now, but, you know, for something where nobody had ever seen anything like this and they just like drop it on the unsuspecting public. And it was like, like you said, like the day before this came out, there was a essentially what is like, or what was the British equivalent to like the, um, like a TV guy. Yeah. Like came out the day before this aired and it said that this was a drama in it. But I mean, if not everybody reads the TV guide, not everybody is going to see that. And I don't know, like something like this is great. And I would love to see more things like this, like a one time only. But I, I don't even know. Do we know how long after this aired, like it was available on like to rewatch? So a decade after it came out, the British Film Institute, the BFI released It on VHS and DVD. In 2011, 101 Films issued a DVD re-release. But mind you, none of these are the BBC releasing it. In 2016, okay, so two years ago, BBC finally made it part of their collection on their website that you could purchase it. 24 years? That's a long time. That's a that's I mean that's a really long time to kind of, you know, blacklist this little documentary this docu drama into the ground because people got so upset about it. Damn. I mean, can you imagine if Orson Welles never worked again because of War of the <laughs> Worlds? You know, but you know what I mean like it's kind of similar. Yeah, but no, instead he parlayed it into a hugely successful film career at least for one movie. Right. Let, yeah, one let, make sure we emphasize one movie. Um F is for fake, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. And, you know, uh, you know, this is another thing about this that I think we we kind of have, you know, listening to him talk about it in the documentary, it gives you a better frame of reference. But, you know, when they talk about the people that loved it when it came out, and Stephen Volk and Leslie Manning both talked about this in the in the interviews that I did with them, it was primarily like, like teenagers and like kids who really liked it. And it was the adults that were angry that they had kind of gotten duped by it. And I just find, I find that hilarious. I find find that so funny in the best way <laughs> i mean it makes sense yeah they just couldn't handle it it sounds like right but that that to me is really funny because when you when you think about it and you think about the way that people are getting kind of like up in arms about it it's just it it's just hilarious i mean like like we've said i mean it feels real within kind of loose constructs but it's i mean it's just one of those things where people adults getting upset about it is just that's just great well let's take a break and we'll play the interviews with the screenwriter uh of ghost watch steven volk and with the director of ghost watch leslie manning and then some commercials and uh, we'll finish up talking about it when we get back <laughs> Outside of the obvious inspiration of the Enfield haunting, what inspired you to write Ghostwatch? Um, well, first of all, it wasn't really directly in response to the Enfield poltergeist that I wrote it. Um, that was one of many cases that I looked at. 
Um, so I can answer that first of all, if I may, and then get back to the other things that inspired it, um, because that's kind of been an accusation that has uh, kind of plagued me through the years. Um, uh, what happened really that it, it was it was a process of evolution that it came to resemble the Enfield uh, haunting, because um, the en- Enfield haunting is a, is a peculiarly English family dynamic um, that that is almost an archetypal poltergeist case with, um, you know, uh, a pre-prevescent female at the center of it, a broken family, dysfunctional family, um, and a kind of semi-suburban kind of setting. In this case, it was um, the outskirts of London. But actually, that is probably what mostly makes people think of Enfield. But in fact, in the earlier drafts of the script, it was going to be, could have easily been Manchester, Sheffield, loads of places your American listeners will not even have heard of. Um, but uh, so it was kind of accidental that it came to resemble uh, the Enfield poltergeist, even though I think because it's archetypal, it was almost bound to. Um, well, and the Enfield haunting is a lot more prescient now because of the Conjuring 2 covering of course it, so. yeah 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 a lot of a lot more people kind of know about it but the thing was uh, one of the guys that investigated the enfield uh, case was guy lion playfair who i knew um and was one of the foremost people that could actually uh, tell uh, someone firsthand as he did to me what it's like to be in a room with things flying around and you know for want of a better word weird shit happening um so he'd already kind of told me that when we were working together on a completely different project, and I actually suggested to the producer of Ghost Watch that uh, they get him in to simply talk to the cast about what it's like to actually live in a haunted house. Um, and true enough, he came along at a small expense because it was a BBC production, so everything's a small expense. Uh, and he talked to the actors about what it felt like to be in that house, um, you know, conveyed the authenticity that he felt the phenomena, you know, obeyed that that, that he was uh, um, observant of, um, and that was very useful. So he got a, he actually got a credit at the end of the program as a consultant, uh, and I think that was a, that was another thing that actually misdirected people to think that it was somehow a kind of pernicious version of the Enfield poltergeist when in fact he he would was just a contact that I suggested to the production to give a bit of authenticity to the um to the crew really um so do you want me to go back to what really was going on with the uh, creation by all it? means go okay. go right ahead um, by all means well i was i was initially going to really proposing a six-part um serial uh to bbc drama a conventional drama um, that would be made a supernatural drama that would be made pretty much like any other filmed uh, drama thriller uh, on the BBC. It was called Ghost Watch, but it wasn't the same concept. But it did, in episode six, have a kind of a reference to a live broadcast from a haunted house because the concept was a paranormal investigator gets in cahoots with a film crew, um, investigative film reporters. Um, This was way back in the mid to late 1980s, uh, this concept, uh, I hasten to add. You know, a million things like it have happened since. But um, anyway, the BBC didn't want to do that. They wouldn't commit to six-part series, uh, supernatural series. Um, You know, they're very wary of that genre uh, compared to, say, a crime series. Um, So the producer was sitting in her office, or I was sitting in her office, rather, and she said, well, we can't do it as a six-hour series, but we, but there is a possibility of doing it as a, a single 90-minute drama. How could we do that? And I said, well, we, we can't do the six-hour drama as a 90-minute. That would be preposterous. But what if we did that idea in episode six, where it's a live broadcast from Haunted House? And I said, as an additional kind of twist, what if we did it? like it really is a transmission from a haunted house and her jaw kind of dropped and she said what well, do you think we can do that and i said well if you know if you're as excited about this the idea as me let's at least try you know so that was really the start of it um and as for as for my kind of intention uh, it, it's going to sound like i knew this going in but it's with the benefit of 25 years hindsight to be perfectly honest um, that i realized that really my uh, my intentions were twofold 
And I think it was kind of the subtext of that first meeting I had with the producer. Uh, first of all, to do a ghost story for TV um, that would work on the TV audience and scare them. That was the first thing. You know, we'd both grown up with TV um, ghost stories. The BBC used to do a ghost story every Christmas. You know, it was kind of a tradition. But, but that had uh, fallen by the wayside. So I'd always, you know, since a teenager or before that, really, since since uh, being a kid in front of the TV set, I've always wanted to do a, t- a ghost story for TV. Um, and this was the kind of idea that I thought that I thought, you know, I really want to do something that's scary, simple as that, that would scare the audience and and also get kids or people like me that love the genre talking about it the next day talking about it when they go into school you know and it's a recess and you always talk about the great show that you've seen the night before or that weekend um but the other thing was i think implicit in when i was pitching it was uh you know it was kind of implicit that this could also be a kind of a bit of a sarcastic critique of the way the media was going you know, uh, the, the central kind of gag at the, at the root of Ghostwatch is what would television do if it could train all its technology on the supernatural, you know, the metaphysical, the, the great question that humankind has wrestled with for centuries, which is, do we survive death? What would, what would a broadcaster do with that question? And the truth of the matter is, I think... Uh, they do it as an entertainment program. They really do it as a base level entertainment uh, ratings grabbing show. And I kind of found that a delicious kind of contradiction intellectually that the most perplexing intellectual question of all time could be reduced <laughs> to light entertainment. And I thought that is that is fun. That is kind of a fun contradiction that could also be scary, dramatic uh interesting so those were the two things going through my mind creating it really so you you mentioned watching horror as a as a as a as a child and you've also you're obviously an established horror novelist and, and a writer i'm curious you know taking one step kind of back even before ghost watch and just as as someone who's a writer who do you draw your influences from as a writer um let me think um I loved um, Richard Matheson. Um, you know, I loved... I grew up on the, the Edgar Allan Poe adaptations he wrote for Roger Corman. I loved his novel, I Am Legend. I loved his adaptation of The Devil Rides Out by Dennis Wheatley. Um, so I loved the fact that he was a novelist one minute, a screenwriter the next minute. And people like Robert Block also seemed to do that. You know, they'd write a novel for you know, which was made by Hitchcock, like Psycho, but also write those wonderful kind of amicus portmanteau films. Um, so the, those were those were the kind of guys that I really not aspired to because it seemed so absurd to even think it was within reach to do that for a living. But you know, when those names came up. When I, uh, on the credits of a, of a show, on the, and, and um, me and my uh, compadres in school, we got you know being nerds and being horror fanatics. We, we you know we would observe these names on the credits and and kind of catalogue their work and that kind of thing long, long before it became a kind of prime industry. Um, but but also I, I would say that uh, you know like I say there was a series of um, ghost stories for Christmas that were done on film and very very creepy that happened in the early late 60s, early 70s, very formal influence really in in the UK on a lot of horror writers. But also there was a writer over here called Nigel Neal who created a character called Quatermass. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it was a very uh, chilling kind of space age. um, He was a rocket scientist, Quatermass, and and he figured in, I think, three different serials on the BBC and then became... um, uh, converted into a hammer film uh, called Quatermass and the Pit, which was which was very scary. Um, and he also adapted uh, 1984, the George Orwell um, novel for the BBC. But in the um, in the 70s, I think I think it was the 70s, um, he wrote a drama called The Stone Tape, and it went out one Christmas, like the traditional time for ghost stories. But it was a modern dress, you know, it was set in the modern time. And it was about a bunch of um, effectively BBC technicians working in a unit in a in an old building that happened to be a haunted house, and they were working on trying to find a new 
means of uh, communication. But, of course, it all kind of goes wrong. What they end up doing is kind of dredging up the forces of darkness um, underneath the, the, the history of the house. And um, that is a specific kind of uh, progenitor of Ghostwatch because it's about technology with all its smugness descending on the unknown and being unable to unravel it, really. And that's where its disturbing factor kind of comes from, I think. And that's what I love about Nigel Neal. He takes science, but he kind of pits it against almost kind of pagan forces or alien forces, which are kind of unknowable. And um, and it creates a wonderful kind of frisson in in the dramas that he writes. So you mentioned Nigel Neal. I'm I'm curious for American audiences who have seen Ghost Watch, myself included. I, I'm curious your thoughts on it if it had any inspiration. If it did, kind of incidentally have inspiration, because that's I I feel is more likely the Orson Welles War of the Worlds. Absolutely, absolutely. I don't think, I'm not sure I even mentioned it in that first meeting, um, but I think we both knew what we were talking about, if, if that makes sense, <laughs> because it was such an o- obvious uh, parallel, uh, you know, um, to actually uh, talk to the public, you know, create a drama for, for the public audience that pretends to be something else in order to make them think it was really happening. Um That was kind of understood, and it was both exciting, very exciting, and also a little bit daunting, because none of us had any idea what effect it was going to have, really. Uh, We were actually terribly uh, worried it would have no effect at all, you know, that nobody would find it scary, everyone would cotton on to it, nobody would find it interesting, and it would all be completely worthless. But, of course, as you know, it didn't quite work out like that, but at the time when we were making it, the producer was certainly most worried about the, um, you know, the news getting out that we were making something that wasn't what we said it was, and someone would, as we say, blow the gaff, and the secret would be out, and um, and and you know, it would be the, the whole project would be kind of castrated by the news getting out, you know. So we had a kind of false name on the script that kind of thing and we swore all the actors to secrecy and uh, and and that kind of thing which was which was fun but nerve-wracking at the time um yeah the Orson Welles uh, broadcast and the other thing strangely that influenced our thinking was um in the early 90s you see the the language of fiction on tv was blurring with the language of non-fiction if i can explain um you were starting to get tv shows like um Hill Street Blues or NYPD Blue that used handheld cameras like documentaries. So drama was, in effect, trying to look like a documentary. And then also we were ha- it was the kind of foothills of reality TV. Um, so non- non-fiction programs were starting to use dramatic techniques like having recreations with actors in them. So you had actors appearing in so-called kind of documentaries and um, and you had do- uh, dramas, you know, being shot by document, like documentaries you know, it's kind of like this implicit tru- truth or false um, uh, dichotomy was being blurred and, and, I, and I think um, with Ghostwatch we were trying to kind of knock a wedge into that thing between them and say, hang on are you even aware this is happening that, you know, the fact that the lines between fact and fiction are being blurred, you know, do you know what you're being told. You know that that person on the TV, just because they've got a caption in front of them saying doctor so-and-so, are they really a doctor? Do they know what they're talking about? You're believing what they're saying. You're believing what the newsreader's saying. It's kind of like it's kind of like fake news, you know what I mean? Which we all recognize now, but it's kind of like, um, yeah, I'm not saying I was a prophet or anything, but that was definitely going through my mind. Do we trust? It's all about trust, Ghostwatch, in a way, because it was, you know, do you trust what you're being told? Do you trust what you're looking at? Can you trust your eyes? And, and of course, in some ways, ghost stories are about that very question. Can you trust what you see? You know, uh, so I thought, you know, th- those kind of ideas were kind of swirling around, really. And, and uh, just we all found them really interesting as, as we were working on it. The night of the premiere of Ghostwatch, they the BBC added the title credit because they were worried about the reaction to... Uh, that's right, and they... Um, what happened really, according to the producer, I wasn't 
involved firsthand, but she was told, unless you... They got, they, they, they got very um, agitated the day before it went out that it would cause shock and panic. Um, so somebody high up said, unless you put a writing credit at the beginning of this program, it's not going to go out. So she literally had to go back in the, in the uh, editing suite and put my name there at the beginning. What she did slightly clumsily was to insert my name amongst the people that were starring in it. So it, it's kind of blink and you miss it. And it's, very, it, it, it's a very strange caption that she really didn't want to do. Um, but it was that or, or the entire thing would be pulled and none of us wanted that. But there were lots of things behind the scenes that um, a lot of kind of, um, you know, when the raft was going round, <laughs> it was kind of like white, what they call it, white, white water rafting, you know, but uh, a lot of it was, was um, dealt with by the producer and director rather than me. And a lot of the battles um, I wasn't privy to. Well, and that's my, my next question is the reaction to it. Uh-huh. I think has has kind of become infamous within <laughs> yeah. Britain. Within Britain, obviously. I mean, again, I think American audiences are just now kind of really finding out about it. I mean, it's on Shutter now, and it's been yeah. on Shutter for at least a year now, and that's yeah. where I initially saw it. Yeah. So, can I tell me what your reaction was to the uproar in Britain? Well, of course, you know, you've got to put yourself down, uh, back to a time when people. Um, well, you could record things off the TV, but they weren't um, endlessly available on catch-up. Um, so if you if you missed it and hadn't recorded it, you wouldn't see it again. So uh, so uh, something like this that probably if people thought was a light entertainment program, they wouldn't have recorded it, um, and they might not have even they might have missed the beginning. So even if they saw it as a writer's caption at the beginning, they missed it. Or they might not have looked at the TV listing that had a list of the cast in it. They might not have looked at it. So all those things. Some people came at it completely unawares. Some people... Uh, and, and, you know, I think psychologically what's fascinating about the reaction to it is that is the wide range of, of people's reaction to it. There were people I know that said, after two minutes, I knew it was completely fake, you know, and that was that. There are people that said, even when it finished, I... I still think even when the BBC apologised for it the next day and explained that it would, that it had been a drama, I still didn't believe them. You know, the most extraordinary reaction was a friend of mine, um, uh, and I said to her a week before, because we writers, you know, don't really like to shout from the, the rooftops, but we like to people know, uh, on the rare occasions we get something on the, on the goggle box. Um, so I said, oh, by the way, I've got this thing on next week. Uh, on Saturday evening on BBC One. Um, and she later said, um, oh, I believe that. And I said, what do you mean? I told you that I'd written it. And she said, yes, but when I saw Michael Parkinson, the, the presenter, I, I thought you must have got it wrong. You know, so there was something about the way it works visually that um, I think people's critical faculty just was bypassed by the fact that it looked like something that didn't look like a drama, you know? Um, and some people were just totally taken unawares by that. Um, but the, so the following week, um, it hit the tabloid newspapers and the headlines went up. And for about a week, it was a big story. Then, to be perfectly honest with you, it cooled off. Um, there were various programs on the BBC. Um, one was called um, Points of View, where people basically write in to complain about things. Another one was called Bite Back, where people are in the studio audience talking to the people that made the programs, again, kind of mostly shaking their fists at, at them. Um, and my producer and executive producer appeared on that and got uh, berated by members of the public who were angry about what had happened. Um, and it seemed anger not really at the nature of the program so much as the BBC um, pulling the wool over their eyes or che- somehow cheating them or taking them for a mug. Um, and it was, of course, that very thing is about how people trust a broadcaster like the BBC. Um, and, you know, that in a, in a way was the subject of the drama. But people didn't like that subject. They wanted to trust the public broadcaster. Um, and that was part of the resentment that built up and the anger, you know. But but after a while, it was very clear the BBC were going to batten down the hatches, not mention the programme ever again, certainly not show it ever again. 
and it kind of all died down and then it was quiet for about 10 years actually and we thought well that's that there's a bit of a flurry of anger and now it's all kind of forgotten and that's that but uh, but the 10th anniversary in 2002 the british film institute wanted to release it on dvd and uh, me and the director and producer got a chance to record a, an audio track so at last we were able to actually record what the hell we were trying to do why we did it what our intentions were that it was a drama it was a drama for a certain reason with a certain theme etc etc um and then, of course, with the coming of the Internet, um, we realized there's all these fans out there. There's all these people that were mostly kids, teenagers, horror fans um, that hadn't complained, hadn't written in, hadn't say, said it shouldn't be allowed or the BBC must never do something like that again or heads must roll at the BBC. But I'd actually quietly really enjoyed it. Some of them thought it was fantastic. Some of them thought it was the best thing the BBC's ever done. And suddenly they want to show it at the university, you know, and they they would ask me to come along and introduce the screening. And um, and that's gone on really ever since for the last uh, 15 years or so, really. And I've realized that uh, it did actually all this time have quite a loyal, loyal kind of following of, of horror fans um, who are just under the radar. And thanks to the Internet, really kind of came out into the light, really. So I'm curious, in your opinion, do you think you could make something like Ghostwatch in a post-social media, everyone is connected to their phones era like we live in now? You know, I think it's, um, people say, would you do it again? You know, people have said to me about other projects, would you do it again? I would say, why would you do it again? It's kind of like you did it then, you know, to revisit something 25 years ago. It's kind of of them, you know what I mean? Not only in the sense a movie always gets dated or anything you do gets dated, but it's, it's peculiarly of then in terms of in terms of if, if you would you couldn't do it now because it would have absolutely no impact. Um, and I would say it's not up to me to do the next Ghost Watch. It's up for it's up to me to see the next Ghost Watch done by somebody in a way that I would never have predicted because I'm not that person, you know. Um, and and it's funny it's 25 years later, so it is almost a generation later when someone is going to find a way of hoaxing or doing something different or you know horror's got a long tradition of doing things that shock people rigid or doing coming at something a different way or that kind of thing and i'm 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 dying to see the next thing that comes out but it won't be it kind of won't be from me i don't think (laughs) well i i mean i think me personally i don't i'm not sure it could be made it's just i think everyone's too connected to everything and people would be all over twitter within the first couple minutes questioning it right well there's the other thing which is um i don't think you can in in the public uh, um or rather the networks in america you're not allowed legally to show something that pretends to be news that isn't news so if we were to do it uh, hypothetically we would have to have a caption all the way through saying this is not live this is not happening which rather kind of takes the teeth out of the whole gag in the first place uh and then of course if it was on a if it was on uh, some other thing like say Shudder then it kind of gives it, what is the point of that that kind of gives you know the place where it appears gives the game away in a, in a sense so I'm not sure the landscape is there to do that this particular thing um, but like I say I think someone will do some something I think the trouble is that the people doing the jiggery pokery and the, the, you know the, the, the malefic um, charms and spells at the moment in terms of um, what we can trust and what we can't trust are probably in the in the political sphere rather than in the sphere of entertainment to be honest and that's uh, that's incredibly uh, worrying but there's not much we can do about that walk me through what your inspiration was kind of your your thoughts about hiding the character in first of all the name i wish i could give chapter and verse on this but i can't but i was watching a documentary about poltergeist case cases and a poor woman whose children were um being haunted by something uh, and hearing knocking in the wall um said i didn't know what to say to my kids so i called him mr radiator or you know, um, and I thought, well, that's kind of, I, I kind of like the idea of that, but I'm not going to use that. Um, and so I used pipes. You know, it's kind of a nickname. I love I love things like that, innocuous things like, you know, Norman in Norman Bates or Freddie. You know, something that doesn't sound threatening is always much more spooky. Um, 
And as for the nature of him, really, I just wanted to throw everything into it. I knew we weren't going to see him much, and we weren't really going to um, encounter him really full on. So really, I wanted him to be as as dark and transgressive in every possible way. So, um, you know, I, I just went for, so he's kind of crazy, he's transgressive sexually, he's probably got bad intentions towards these kids. So everything I could think of, I wanted to churn up the idea that he, that this, that this um, malevolent character is kind of, pure evil in every in every sense that you could possibly think really um or, or just not 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 evil actually that's that's that implies that someone that cross dresses is evil i don't don't mean that but what i mean is that that they 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 um they're not they're not um everything about them is not quite the norm you know so they're mentally unstable they live in a house where the their um uh, their family when clearly they they shouldn't be and you know just just every possible thing I could to to make him make him feel like a kind of bogeyman really. So I'm also curious about the like you mentioned you didn't want them to kind of see him full on, and I think one of the more successful things that's done kind of covertly the first time you watch it and the more times you watch it the more times you pick up on it is the use of the ghost being hidden in some of the shots and kind of in the background. Was that something you initially thought about when well, you were, were writing? Two, there were two, two moments that when I was writing it that I really thought, you know, if these two moments work, I will be very happy indeed. One was the idea that, um, hang on, what we've been watching is not going live. Uh, the ghost is actually showing us old footage. You know, when they notice at the end that the picture that fell off the wall is now back on the wall. So hang on, this must be old footage. I thought that was a spooky idea that we're actually something's going on in the house, but we can't see it because the ghost is stopping us to see it. The other thing which I was really pleased with was the idea that you have a camera in the in the uh, someone phones in and says they've seen something in the bedroom. You show the footage to the audience at home who's watching. They see a figure in the in the room, but the guy on TV says, "I don't see anything." Do you? And I thought, if I can, if I can get people at home thinking, "I did see something," he says he didn't see something, but I did see something, you know. And they say, "Oh, don't be stupid." I thought, if I can achieve that, then the whole thing would have been worthwhile, really. So, um, so yeah, that those are the two things I was aiming for. But, but also, I felt. Once in this particular thing, as it was evolving, once you were to see him full on, somehow the whole thing would would fall. I think like a stack of cards, um, because I think this kind of ghost story that's trying to get under your skin, um, uh, there would be nowhere to go once you once you kind of see him really. Um, and and you know, it, it's just lessons I've got from other horror stories. For God's sake, you know, anyone that writes horror knows this. You know, Alien was most frightening before you saw the thing at the end um and you know the haunting did virtually all, all its you know scares with just sound and things happening off screen you know um so it, you look at the classic horror films and and they all tell you how to do it um well i would agree i mean i mean even when you look at something like jaws i mean you never see the shark until the very, very end. And it's successful because of that. And me personally, I feel like horror in the 21st century has lost some of that subtlety. A lot of that subtlety. Kind of too easy in a way to press a button and put a bit of magic that will, that will I mean, visual visual magic in that enhancing a scene, say, that, that will make it unreal. But somehow that unreality that goes into making a special effects moment um, to me is exactly what takes me out of the film being scary because I'm thinking, oh, that was clever or that was nicely lit or that was a good bit of prosthetics and all those things distract me from getting involved with the characters and, and the moment um, not that I can't enjoy those films for what they are but, um, but you know a lot of the time, less you know, less is more. You know, I'm 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 more inclined towards that scene in in the Sixth Sense where the woman walks out of the kitchen and when she comes back in the kitchen and and it's still the same shot, but she walks back into the kitchen and all the cups that are hanging up are broken, and it's all done in one shot, and it's really spooky. That's all that happens, you know, and it's just a 
bit of clever camera work uh, and something that you don't expect. Uh, and, it, and it just gives me a shiver just to think about that. You know, whereas, you know, a scene from, say, the woman in black with a woman that looks like a witch flying through the air, you know, with all this makeup on, that doesn't make me feel scared at all. It's a good story, but it doesn't make me feel scared. <laughs> There's all sorts of different. Uh, I think actually horror, as kind of in the in this century, has uh, it's kind of a path that's um, that's forked in a way, or forked into maybe two or three different genres. I think there's the almost kind of big budget special effects horror ghost train. Um, you know, be it at one end of the scale, kind of Van Helsing or or, or something like that, which is kind of almost action horror, or The Mummy is another example. With which I don't. I think they kind of almost leave horror behind and become become kind of action fantasy, really. And then if you go in the other direction, I think there's really interesting things being done in in uh, the indie world. You know, the the films like It Follows and The Babadook and The Witch movies on a, on a kind of smaller scale that can be a bit more um, edgy and experimental in, in their effects. You know, I think uh, I think. It, you know, it's it's healthy. It's really healthy at the moment, really. Kind of what were your thoughts on it? What's your personal kind of proudest moment from script to screen of Ghost? It was Watch? a little bit of a shock, I admit, because um, uh, some of the scenes were completely reordered. Um, so, so they didn't really happen in the order that I put them in the script. Um, so, you know, that always happens in shooting, and it's always it always... Um, you know, it makes your head spin slightly. Um, and whether it's Ghost Watch or it's anything else that I've done, it always takes uh, a few watches and a few, um, uh, you know, months, if not years, to, to actually settle into accepting what the finished product is rather than what was in your head. Because um, inevitably, what's in the writer's head is completely different than what is even feasible it's never the same you know um even if you, even if i were to direct it with an unlimited budget etc etc th- you know thing, things do not turn out the same as you want it in 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 your, in your head and sometimes that's for better because an awful lot of clever people work on it and improve it um but um i think those two moments are what i enjoyed best the um you know those kind of the, those those moments where you feel inherently that the audience at home might be thinking when I did see something, or you know, when I, it's funny when I watch it now with an audience, um, usually of quite smug students, um, and they all kind of know about it, or usually fifty percent have seen it before, which is interesting. Um, they always begin laughing at it for about ten minutes. You know, they're all TV presenters they've seen, and it's a bit hokey. It's like a, a you know a kind of crappy low rent. Um, light entertainment show that they normally wouldn't watch um, and they come at it quite uh, with a superior kind of intellect really um, and then about halfway through it's quite extraordinary they start to get a bit quieter and start to uh, laugh a lot less and um, get slightly disturbed by it and by the end you feel that they've really <laughs> got got very disturbed by it sometimes or, or you know and I was going to say or but and or um, enjoyed it um, rather than be dismissive of it, which is what they expected to be, you know. So, so that's very instructive to watch it with a live audience, even though it was never intended to be shown on the big screen. It's uh, it's it's always fun to watch it on the big screen. So, you know, speaking about you know going around because you mentioned that you go around to college campuses and and um, you've been invited to screen it. In your personal opinion, how do you think? It's aged um, in, in well. I think years. in terms of uh, if you if you look at anything else from that era, nineteen ninety two, uh, anything would be horrendously aged in terms of TV tastes now. Just in terms of everything from the way it's shot to the uh, you know the the quality of the image to the to the graphics to the haircuts to the way people act or behave on screen is is. Is, it's a generation different, as I said earlier. So it's not surprising that it's that it's dated in some ways. But I never have a problem with things being dated in that sense. I mean, some of my favorite films are horror films from the '60s, and I can still watch them. I would watch them right now um, in fa- you know, rather than 
you know some of the films that are released at the moment i would still get a big kick from them because i can i can put aside the fact that it's going to be dated um and i would hope that the a reasonable viewer would be able to see that it was a it, it was a novel an original idea at the time even if they can't forgive some of the uh the style choices that were open to us at the time. Um, I hope they can see that it was, uh, you know, some filmmakers trying to do something different more than anything. Well, and I think for myself personally, the fact that it looks kind of yeah, like yeah. it's from the nineties, I think works in its favor. Be- I don't know. It's just, it, there's something about, and ne- I mean, this is really kind of insane to say, but period horror pieces, because even though it is from the nineties, it is period horror. Uh, there's something about period oh, horror that just seems oh, to, to elevate <laughs> elevate it in a way. Yeah, but I, I mean, again, like when I saw that it was on Shutter, I had I'd kind of heard about it again. I mean, American audiences, like you've mentioned, that just it never made it over here. No, of course not. Well, they didn't allow it to be shown elsewhere. Right. You know, the BBC uh, literally did not want it shown. Um, Which is kind um, of insane. There was a rumor that, uh, yeah, I know that Oren Pelly, who did uh, Paranormal Activity, had seen it because he was asked in an interview to recommend half a dozen films that he sure he thought should be known more widely and he mentioned ghost watch as being one of them which was a, which was a great uh, thrill to to see that he uh, he mentioned that uh, whether the guys who did Blair Witch had seen it, I still haven't got to the bottom of whether they had or not. I think someone once asked them and they'd never heard of it, but so I take that at face value. But um, I'd kind of I'd kind of like to know. I, th- I you see, I think the Blair Witch um, found footage uh, subgenre. People say, do you feel responsible for that? You know, do you feel that Ghost Watch kicked off that thing? And I, I don't really, because um, I think that was simply kicked off by, you know, the technology becoming so available to people, um, small camcorders that they could carry around and, and that kind of thing. I think it was the availability of the technology um, altered the kind of stories they could tell with the technology, you know? Um, so that's what I think gave, you know, opened the door to the found footage horror. Well, and would you consider Ghost Watch to be found footage? Uh, n- no, because it, was, it the term didn't exist when it was done, so it, so I don't see how it could could be really. It was. Um, I don't even like calling it a hoax. Actually, to be honest with you, that was we never ever used that word when we were devising it. It was a drama. It was a drama that was going to be done in a certain way. Um, you know, the, the prime purpose wasn't to be a hoax, like an April Fool. Um, you know the BBC wouldn't gonna, wouldn't give us you know whatever it whatever it did give us you know seven hundred thousand pounds or whatever it was for you know, probably a lot more than that but not much more than that actually um, to do a ninety minute drama you know they would they don't do that for a kind of prank um, you know they had to justify it to themselves and and to their superiors as a piece of drama that was worth making you know um, so it wasn't uh, you know people say it was. A kind of hoax, a joke, and that kind of thing. I mean, it, it was a joke in that it had kind of satirical intent, uh, um, as well as the intent to scare you, like a ghost story should. But it wasn't uh, the prime directive; wasn't to be a hoax. Well, I've, I mean, I wouldn't call it a hoax, but could, I guess I could see why someone would make that statement. I mean, then you just. Yeah. You could say yeah. that any form of entertainment is a hoax because it's not. I mean, you watch a Marvel movie, <laughs> you're not expecting that to be real. I mean, that's not re- any more real than anything else. No, but I think I think in the case of Ghost Watch, it was pretending to be a live show um, that was really happening. Uh, that was the style we were doing it in, um, you know, and that, and that's what people objected to more than anything. Uh, obviously, it, it's had an it's had an effect on on your career, um, kind of. Tell me a little bit about how Ghost Watch has affected your career and kind of your your notoriety in in kind of the in the industry and in what you do for a living. <laughs> My notoriety in the industry that sounds that sounds like I'm a terrible person, but uh... <laughs> no, not like that. <laughs> I know what you, not like I know that. what you mean. Like I know that. what you mean. I'm not, I know you're not trying to imply that, but you you never know. I might be notorious in the industry for all you know. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I think. For good or ill, I think it kind of branded me as that 
ghost story writer. And to be honest, I've lived through that quite happily as someone that's interested in the paranormal and ghost stories all my life. And I, I don't, there's no other genre that I like writing as much probably. Um, but, um, you know, I do tire of, of the half dozen times people say, can we do another one of those? Meaning, you know, something that pretends to be live. Uh, and I really don't want to do that. Um, Although, um, you know, I, I, like I say, I've, I've, I've plowed the furrow of um, ghost stories, supernatural stories, um, quite happily since then. And, uh, you know, written books and dramas and drama series um, uh, that probably have Ghostwatch as a, as a kind of start point of that career in a way. After reading everything I've ever read about it, it sounds like everyone just went completely apeshit. And <laughs> I mean, and the same thing happened in, in the United States with the Orson Welles War of the Worlds yeah. broadcast. I mean, people were grabbing their guns to go and hunt down the aliens that were <laughs> landing. I mean, it's you know, it's that's this is the closest kind of Well, it wasn't quite that... as bad as people taking to the streets and getting in their cars and leaving their homes, you know, it wasn't quite like that. But we did get, for instance, um, a priest who rang the BBC and said, even though the BBC said it wasn't true, he thought the BBC had inadvertently raised demonic forces, you know. There were three women who were pregnant at the time they watched Ghost Watch, and all three of them presumably at different locations, went into labor that night, which means that their kids probably are 26 years old now, um, which I find a bit frightening. Maybe that's a sequel, I don't know. Um, but my but my favorite one was a letter that came to the producer from a woman um, whose, whose husband was a, uh, a veteran of the Falklands conflict, um, the recent uh, war that we'd, we'd had with Argentina, and uh, he was so scared by the program that he literally pooed his pants, and she wanted compensation from the BBC to buy him a new pair of jeans, um, which has got to be, that's got to be a high point if you're a horror writer to, to actually cause someone to literally dirty their pants. <laughs> Oh, Jesus Christ. I just can't imagine someone shitting themselves because of how scary it is. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I, I mean, again, like, I'm watching it as an adult and knowing that it's a, a, a piece of fiction. I mean, I, I'm, I've, the first time I watched it, I tried to put myself in that, the mind frame of someone watching it in. You know, the funny thing, uh, thinking back on it, is that it was usually or almost exclusively adults that got angry about it. Children uh, or kids around 12 or 13, uh, I think, I've got a theory about this. I think children are vulnerable um, uh, figures in our society. They're used to being victims. So they have a kind of very um, malleable sense of what's real and what's imaginary. Um, and I think they are quite capable of thinking around whether something's true or false. And it's adults that become entrenched in uh, what being told what's true, being told what's false. And if they if they get their foundation of belief shaken, they don't like it. But children are are kind of volatile about about belief because you know they are you know they are down the pecking order, so to speak, really. So um, I think that's why children uh, we we tended to get reactions from kids that maybe uh, went to school the next week and they did a whole project about Ghost Watch. They drew pictures about it. They talked about it. We got sent pictures that the kids drew of the ghost and this kind of thing. Um, and, um, you know, not not couched in a negative way at all, really. Um, so that, that I found was, found was curious, is that there was adults that had their security kind of threatened but not children well i would assume also part of it is because we as adults feel like we have a pretty good sense of like you said what is real and false well i think maybe kids also see the fun side of the anarchic side of doing something that pretends to be not what it is and maybe they kind of got the gag earlier um and they found it a bit more exciting rather than upsetting for that reason you know it is possible for people to find it upsetting and exciting. This is the extraordinary thing. I mean, people have come up to me and said, you know, when I saw that, when I was 12 years old, I didn't sleep for a week. I left the light on. My, my sister had to sleep in the same room. But you know what? It made me want to make horror films. And I'm still making horror films today. Or, you know, and you think, wow, that's, you know, you, I, I was 
kind of answer by saying, I don't know whether to say sorry or thank you very much. Um, <laughs> both, yeah. Why not both? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, I know for me personally, I remember the first horror movie I ever watched was Poltergeist. And, I mean, it scared me yeah. senseless. And I didn't watch horror movies for the longest time. And then I kind of, when I turned 16, I, I really got into it. So, I mean, you know, but I remember thinking to myself now, like, you know, when you're scared, there's something exciting, like you said, about about being scared. And yeah. kind of it, it, pushes, yeah. it pushes certain buttons well, I, in certain my, directions. My general philosophy about horror is that it's, um, that it's a, a, a force bad. for good, good in society <laughs> um, rather than bad. I think it's only people that are not horror fans that think it's somehow... Um, you know, shouldn't be allowed. But I think it's uh, it's not it's never done me any harm. Put it like that. Apart from being notorious, <laughs> <laughs> that's I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus Christ, <laughs> the notorious. Yeah, I mean, again, yeah. you well, know, I do, just, I do. I mean, you know, that kind of you know that stuff with, with Orson Welles young forever. Producer so I was who, just, you know, you know trying to p- pitch ideas to them, and the first thing they want to talk about is Ghost Watch because they saw it when they were like six years old or eight years old. Um, you know, and the, obviously the first reaction I have is, "Oh my God, I'm so old," <laughs> and they're so young. <laughs> but it is quite flattering that at least they wanted to talk about it. I mean, you know, Kim Newman, who's a film critic over here, kind of expert on on horror, really. Wow. Um, he says, uh, "How many other TV shows do you remember from October 1992?" You know, <laughs> not many. Twenty five years later, so at, at least we must have been doing something right. Have a hunger for horror, a yen for Yelp yarns? Then give your blood-curdled bones a boon and tune in to Chronicles from the Crypt. Join Sordid Slime Slingers Casualty Chris and Father Malone as they take on HBO's groundbreaking television series, Tales from the Crypt. Here's what the rotting and rancid rabble are saying about Chronicles from the Crypt. (laughs) Tune in to Chronicles from the Crypt. You have nothing to lose except your life. is Carl Kolchak. He's a reporter. Now that is news, Vincenzo. News! And we are a news paper. We are supposed to print news, not suppress it. With the INS. What's an INS? Independent News Servicer, founded in 1904 by Enrico Peluzzi. Who seems to have a nose for the strange and unusual. Well, last year in Las Vegas, I uncovered a series of murders that turned out to have been committed by a vampire. And what is the Kolchak Tapes? It's a podcast. All about Carl Kolchak. What's a Kolchak? The Night Stalker. And where can you get it? On iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and at www.kolchaktapes.com. As foolish a game as any that Gory the Ghoul could make up. Here's what some people are saying about the Projection Booth Podcast. Week after week, I'm mesmerized by the focus given great films and questionable films alike. But every episode is a learning and entertaining experience. This is hands down the best movie podcast. They cover so many different genres across so many years, from obscure movies to blockbusters. If there's only one podcast about movies and cinema that you listen to, make it this one. The Projection Booth Podcast, with new episodes available every week at projectionboothpodcast.com. In 1985, a curious phenomenon occurred. The Twilight Zone returned to television, featuring all new tales of mystery and imagination from the minds of Ray Bradbury, Harlan Ellison, George R.R. Martin, and Stephen King. Dreams for Sale, the Twilight Zone 85 podcast looks back at that land of shadow and substance and re-examines the groundbreaking successor to Rod Serling's legacy. Featuring new interviews with the show's creators and cast, Dreams for Sale can be found on iTunes and at twilightzone85.com. Dreams for Sale. We'll be waiting for you in the Twilight Zone. So how did you initially get involved with Ghostwatch? Well, I was working with Ruth Baumgarten on a film called uh, My Sister Wife, and we were doing post on that. And she, as the producer, she said, uh, would I read this script? And uh, yeah, it just wouldn't let me go. Yeah. So So what did you think of the initial script? (laughs) 
Um, there was always uh, I loved it, though, but um, it, it was it was more when we first started. There were a lot of sort of strands to it, and I think probably Stephen might have told you the same thing. Um, uh, and we had to sort of we had to clean it up uh, and make it more of one story for the exec producers. Um, so, so I went on that journey with him. But the first thing that really that really sold me on the script was the moment when Michael Parkinson said he couldn't see anything in the shadows, and there was something in the shadows as scripted and as we did it. So I just had this uh, immediate ambition that there would be people half watching Halloween night, you know, in and out, and then and then sort of yelling from the settee, "I can see something! I can see something!" and Michael Parkinson can't. And I just thought that 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 was just intriguing. So it was the it was the reality nature of it, then kind of the misdirection that really drew you in initially. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you you read the script, kind of, you know, walk me through the process of what happened next, kind of getting on the set and starting to work with, with Michael Parkinson and Sarah and, and Mike and, and Craig. So do you, do you know any of these characters over in America? Obviously not, I imagine. I, I mean, I, I know who they are kind of uh, reading after the fact. And we, I mean, there are analogs in the States, obviously, to kind of who they are, who they were in the 90s. Okay. So, um, uh, so well, just to, to so so we we streamlined the script a bit towards the one location, one story of the two girls, um, and then of course the casting process. It was we were very keen to have, I suppose, personalities, people that you know you would recognise from the television. Um, so, Michael Parkinson hadn't been on the television at that time for a couple of years, but he was absolutely iconic for that natural interview style that he had. Um, you know, he was very famous for for um, interviewing Muhammad Ali, and so you know, so there was he had this wonderfully natural style. So we 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 were really pleased to to get him. Um, and Sarah Green had just come off children's television, and then and then by the casting director because we were. The complicated thing was that we were from film department, but we were stepping into which was really a faux TV thing. So there was lots of it was quite complex that crossing over all the time. Um, it wasn't like we just did went out there for one night with a you know with TV cameras. We were, came from the film department, and and they were quite upset when I said, "Look, I'm really going to shoot this with TV cameras." Um, they wanted it all to be on film. You know, there was all that 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 artifice of film. They wanted it on film because we were it was film, and, and uh, yeah, they were they were quite shocked that I actually wanted to get get it onto into be very pure with the TV language. Um, so yeah, Sarah Green, and then the casting director. Um, uh, suggested that Mike Smith, who was another TV personality, who was her husband in reality, was involved. So there was that crossover, and then Stephen really uh, embraced that, and we put that, we made that part of the script at the end that he was worried about her when she was stuck in the cupboard, you know. So yeah, so that was the, that that evolved through the casting. That, that little part of the story. So you mentioned, you know, the, that these folks were all, like you said, they were all, these are them portraying themselves, obviously. How important was it when you were working on casting that you cast identifiable people from kind of the news and kind of the, the, the news world in Britain and in the UK? Um, well, it was just part of the fun if we could get them to, to do it. You know, it was, it was, it was just part of the fun. Um, I suppose if everybody had said no to us, we would have gone through to casting actors. Um, the actors that were there were Gillian Bevan, who played the parapsychologist, Breege Brennan, who played the um, uh, the mother, obviously the children. So, yeah, there's was, there was quite a few um, actors. But, yeah, if, if everyone had turned us down, we would... It, you know, we would have carried on. But it, it, it was quite, it was fun. It was just a fun element of it. Well, and I mean, you know, knowing what the response ended up being in the public, I think it helped kind of drum up the fervor and help sell it, obviously, which which is the which is one of the best things about it is how straight faced it is and kind of reality kind of reality forward Ghostwatch ends up being even all the way through to the end. Yeah. 
We actually had no idea. Well, I personally had absolutely no idea that the public was going to react the way they did. Uh, that's that's same same thing Stephen said. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know... Um, Talk to me a little bit about working, uh, you know, working on the set with them, what that was like on a day to day basis. Um, well, um, Sarah Green had had a, a, a um, had started in drama school, so she was very keen. So although she was a TV presenter, she was very happy to go back to what she saw as her roots. So 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 that was great. Uh, Brie Brennan, the actor who played the mother, she was a consummate professional um, actor. Um, so Michael Parkinson was really interesting because um, analysing the style of performance from Michael Parkinson, there's either the autocue, which has its own sing-song rhythm when they're reading autocue. It has a slight projection and it also has a slight artifice. Um, and then when he's off script and talking to his, I mean, this is him as he was. Do you see what I mean? So when he's talking to his uh, interviewee, he has this wonderful conversational, relaxed style, which makes him feel really special. So that's, I mean, when we gave him the script, he, it was beginning to sound like autocue because he was just, it, because that's that's his his training. So during the rehearsal period, we broke that open. So we just said, look, don't worry about the script. You know the points. We would, you know, we would rehearse the sequences um, in the studio. And uh, we, we, we'd sort of just remind him, I'd remind him the points that he had to make and where he had to get to. Um, and then to treat Gillian Bevan, who was his interviewer, to, to, you know, in exactly the same way as he's always with that wonderful relaxed manner. Um, but, of course, that put Gillian, who was a trained actress, waiting for her cue lines in a completely uh, awkward spot because she actually had to really stay on her toes. And because she was off the page, you know, verbatim Stephen's script and, and Michael Parkinson was somewhere around it. So it was really interesting. But we were just always forever trying to get to that real, you know, real reality and break away from... What was happening at the time was that even every performance had a slight artifice, whereas it's not so much now, but then there was a, an artifice that I was trying to get rid of all the time. Well, I, again, I, I think it personally comes through, you know, the way, you know, in, in, a, in a way that, again, it feels it feels natural. And if that's clearly what you were going for it, you know, I can I can imagine the dichotomy between the two one off script and one just kind of doing what he does normally can be a little bit of a little bit of a kind of an interesting situation to work through. Yeah, we used to rehearse and rehearse and rehearse these massive long takes and, you know, which was mimicking the uh, the um, live TV language, and in, but instead of live TV where they package stuff and go between cameras, we had all the cameras running and we took it back to the editing room. So, yeah, we used to rehearse these really long takes, it, sort of all up to midday, and then we'd go into these long takes. As soon as we got them, we'd just, bre- we'd just break and then do the same thing the next day. Of course, everything in the everything on the wall in the background in the the wall of TVs was all was all pre recorded two weeks before in the house. So we had like a five week shoot. Obviously, you've talked a little bit about working with Michael Parkinson and Jillian Bevan in the studio. You know, uh, tell me a little bit about working on on the on the set at the house with you know Sarah Green and and the child actors and and everyone else. Okay, so um, it was a it was a it's a real council house. It was just empty that we, you know, obviously, you know, found as a location. Um, And I was quite keen that it was a very accessible location that people could identify without it being too special or spooky or anything. So it was a real, it was a, it was a, it was a real council house. And um, stylistically, I just, uh, uh, I, I was quite pure with it. So we had, we had cameras in the room, you know, um, wide angle cigarette cameras, they were called, uh, strapped into the corners of the room. And then we had the roving camera from our um, cameraman. And because because I was quite keen to blur the edges between fact and fiction or drama and reality all the time. Uh, we advertised at the BBC for a volunteer camera and sound guy to actually be on screen, to be part of the performance, as it were. 
and um and we got two people coming forward and they're the guys that did it so we had one cameraman come forward and one sound guy come forward um so so they were you know so we weren't we didn't have to mess about with actors trying to look like they were using the camera so you know, do you see what i mean so mm, it was cameramen looking like actors yeah exactly exactly yeah so obviously you know at the time and i i personally still think it's it's a very groundbreaking piece of media ghost watches uh you know in in found footage films and obviously this is found footage mixed with kind of faux documentary uh you know the the ca- the camera being on constantly is kind of always a uh, it's a conceit that the audience has to kind of either accept or not accept and i think in ghost watch it works because of the way that it's staged uh, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, working inside the house itself and kind of being able to really get the shots. You know, some of the shots early on are, are, are you know, it's kind of innocuous where you have uh, Keith Ferrari's pipes kind of just showing up in shots. Uh, you know, talk to me a little bit about how important it was for you to get um, those those kind of shots with him in the background just kind of as i don't know as as innocuous as possible yeah i suppose yeah i suppose it's it was a it was a it was a bit of a knife edge because you didn't you don't you don't want to the game's up if you if you're too obvious with him um and yeah uh but but at the same time it was fun to see him so it yeah it was a bit of a knife edge all that um um, but I do remember, I do remember going down to makeup when they because because the storyline is that his face is uh, scratched with cats, um, and the makeup artist did this fantastic job with eye missing, fantastic, you know, really gory, and um, <clears throat> and I went down and said, you, you know, it, it's great, and it's 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 what it is, what the story is about, but I'm not going to show it much at all i mean they they took that because i just i think once i'd cross that line into gore then you lose i'd lost uh, i felt i was going to lose i wanted to make the the piece for the uninitiated you know not uh, not cross the line for the blood and guts gore horror do you see what i mean so so yeah so i kept it quite i kept him quite obscure but at the same time i liked him in there does that answer your question? Count online the list is uh, that there are nine times in Ghost Watch that you can see the ghost, aka pipes. Uh, is is that the total number? Are there more? Uh, were there more that were kicked around that never made it in? There was definitely, yeah, there were definitely a couple that producer insisted I take out. Um, <laughs> Um, I I seem to remember that we we did slightly get in, me and the editor slightly got into it and we were um, putting them anywhere um, and um, and and I th- I thought we were working on a on a, on the number of thirteen but I know we got I know uh, I I know at least one was taken out um, so do you know what I don't know <laughs> I don't know what the number is well because I've seen thirteen but everything I, I've read has nine oh you've seen thirteen. The- Great. <laughs> well, I no, I haven't seen the thirteen, oh. but I'm I've seen I've seen that number kicked around, but the kind of the the lists that I've seen say nine. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. What were some of the ones that got taken out? Um, there was some. Um, I think there's one that still exists, but the, you know, in the whip pans, we could sneak something in. Um, you know, things that were, were easier. I mean, a lot were staged in. Um, you know, when you know when the tape's going and he's. Uh, He's actually in there, and we just tickle some light on him, so you sort of see him, and then, and then reflection in the glass in the house. Um, we had him so that you could just uh, see him. He appears behind Brige Brennan when she's talking about the terrible things that are happening in the house. Um, we just we just tickle him in, um, but but then it was sort of quite easy, I suppose, to sneak the odd uh, sort of flash frame when the lights were going in the state in the studio when the chaos was happening. So, yeah, just to stick the odd couple of frames in. Is there one of those kind of sightings in the film that sticks out to you as as kind of more successful or the one that you, you kind of are proud of the most? Um, I suppose it's the... Um the, the, it's the whip pan back from the cameraman when he's when he's spooked um, in the curtains. So when they're all being shunted out of the room, um, yeah. Yeah, I I really like the one in the studio. I think the one in the studio, kind of the third one in the film. I think that one always. Anytime I've 
I've talked to anyone about it or I've I've told someone to watch it. They're like, that first one is just where it kind of fades in and then fades back out. And then you realize there's no one uh, behind Jillian Bevan. I think it's just so successful and really, um, like you said, the whole thing with Michael Parkinson, kind of the audience questioning whether or not he saw anything when they saw something. That's kind of reminiscent of that. It's like, did I see something? Because no one else seems to, you know, yeah. say anything about it. Well, that was the moment. That was the moment in the writing that I was completely hooked. So I'm really, uh, I'm really pleased if that comes over in the finished thing. Well, I, I think it's also the one, the one moment early on that you kind of really get the sense that there is something more going on. Yeah, like you said, it's the hook. It's the really that is the the kind of the hooking point. So, um, so let, let's talk a little bit about uh, you doing the voice for Pipes uh. because appar- <laughs> appar- apparently you couldn't get what you wanted out of the other people that you had had the performance with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if it's the same in America, but um, so we booked a voiceover artist to do the ghost's voice um, because obviously Pipes himself was a supporting artist, um, uh, and so we had finished the we'd finished the piece, and uh, we were in the we were in the in the sound booths and doing you know final mixes and preparing for the final mix. And the voiceover artist came in and he was like incredibly skilled uh, at every accent in the UK. But when I asked, you know, doing a ghost is something completely different. So so when he left, I just said, look, it's to the to the guys. I said, it's, it's absolutely not what I want. And um, we were talking about it. And um, and they and, uh, and I said, I, they said, well, what do you want? And I said, well, it's something like this. And they just said, look, you know, let's do it. So as I was describing what I wanted they just uh, you know taped it so I became the voice of the ghost well that's how you get exactly what you want right do it yourself so <laughs> that's what I've been told at least if you want something done right do it yourself <laughs> uh, I suppose the interesting thing is that it, it needed performance in the sense that uh, which voiceover like a voiceover artist doesn't feel like it, it it felt like it needed someone who was desperate that's how I mean the voice needed to feel desperate and that was mm-hmm. this, that was the missing element. So it had to be coming from a specific kind of place. Yeah, it had to be. It had to be from a, an emotive place. I think. Uh, I mean, I'm, I don't know how, how far I got there, but it had to be a different place from from yeah from just technical. So let's let's talk a little bit about the the end of Ghost Watch because towards the end, Ghost Watch essentially comes completely off the rails. You have Sarah Green getting trapped in the cupboard. You have Michael Parkinson getting possessed seemingly by the ghost. Uh, yeah, talk to me a little bit about ratcheting up the the tension towards the end of of Ghost Watch. Um, uh, well, I suppose it starts to go when the when the lights go and the, and the cameraman falls down the stairs and then they have to put on the infrared. I, I suppose, and when she gets stuck in the then when she gets stuck into the cupboard, um, um, which was quite a palaver because it was a council house so we had a like masses of things happening in a tiny cupboard <laughs> like right wind smoke um and trying to get sarah green in there um yeah i mean i do i do remember when we were destroying the studio as it was as it were um the uh, lighting cameraman we were discussing what would what it would look like and they just let we just let we just talked our way through it and then we left the house lights on and didn't do any lighting and you got this fantastic, murky, you know, end of the world feel in the studio that was really, uh, which I, which we all, do, you know, yeah, that that's it. That we we're so pleased with that. And then also the cameras, they've got this wonderful hydraulic feel that these cameras have. That so you can just push them and they glide across the floor because they're, you know, you know, because they they're made because they're so heavy. They're made with that ease, and we so we just push the camera around and then sh- shot what we were you know what what was on the camera and the natural and the hydraulics on the camera when they're unmanned they have that wonderful slow droop um as, as the camera heads fall down and so so i i let michael parkinson wander around the studio any you know anywhere he wanted to and with these cameras in any position they wanted to to see what i got just to try and get that end of the end of the world feel 
It always just cracks me up how uh, how kind of nonchalant his reaction is at the end, <laughs> where he's just kind of walking around as the the studio is being torn apart by the, the wind and, and kind of that you know the, the ghost, and it's just it always strikes me as so odd. As an, I think probably as an American, because if it were in the United States and that were going on, I mean, you'd have people going completely ballistic <laughs> in the studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, maybe, but uh, I suppose I suppose I suppose I wanted him to have a slight cu- to be uh, curious and unnerved, whereas everyone else going mad. That's what I was hoping to achieve. Gotcha. And I, again, I think it I think it completely works in a in a way that again is you know is is completely believable and sells sells the uh, sells the just the lie, I guess, <laughs> in a way. So. Uh, so you you wrap up shooting. You're in the editing booth. You've already talked a little bit about certain kind of things on the cutting room floor, like some of the apparitions, the apparition sightings not making it into the final cut. Was there anything else that any kind of other parts of Ghost Watch that ended up not making it into the final televised cut? Um, yeah, there was part. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, we had to. In any piece, you lose you lose stuff. Um, I, we lost a bit at the end. Um, uh, uh, and we'd uh, we definitely tightened. We would. I don't think we. I can't remember losing um, whole scenes. But I do remember that we did. We had to tighten up a lot. Um, we showed it to Ruth and I showed it to a, a, a trusted friend of hers, a French critic. Um, she had a critic background, and um, he said that he thought it was intellectually very stimulating, but not at all scary. And I was so disappointed. Um, and so we went, I went back into the cutting room and um, really, really tried to talk it up with the, with the editor. So, yeah, so we, yeah, so we were quite, we were quite, I, I like to think that I'm quite hard on it in the sense, to indulge ourselves. Well, I, I mean, again, you know, the first time I watched it, I was definitely, there, there are some moments of, of, of dread and, and tension. So, I mean, obviously the, the editing, the going back in and, and editing it, um, worked. So, you know, the, the way it was received in the UK mm. is comparable to the way Orson Welles' War of the Worlds broadcast was received in the States in some respects. Yeah. Obviously, no one was going to grab guns to run down to the house and start shooting at the ghosts. But um, kind of for you, what was it like kind of hearing the reaction and the responses to Ghost Watch after it aired and, and during it airing? Well... Uh, so the so the night that it went out, um, Ruth, the producer, had much more of a sense actually than than certainly I had of of what might happen. She so she had us all going to a party and kept us off the street. So we all went to this party to watch it going out um, that night. She wa- she didn't want anyone to see us because she wanted it to feel like it was live. Obviously, we'd finished it you know two months before. Um, and then she went. She actually went to Television Centre, BBC, to man the phones because we'd put up a phone number, as you probably remember. Um, and so we actually we had a proper team of um, uh, parapsychologists, and we took it very seriously that people would take the phone number very seriously. So there was the normal uh, banks of people who would answer phones, and our own that we supplied um, to answer the, this phone number. And of course, and they were just jammed. I mean, they were just the phone lines were completely jammed, especially that five minutes where the ghost appears and doesn't. The one we, the minute, the the part we're talking about, um, they just couldn't. People couldn't get through at all. There's some, you know, ludicrous figures about I don't know thousands of people trying to get through um, to police stations all up and down the country as well. So um, everyone was worried about where Sarah Green had gone. Um, and then the other thing is that we have this thing called presentation, uh, which like um, talks about the, the program after it's gone out. And there's there was uh, um, nobody knew quite what to do in presentation. Like, and it's I w- I've been told since that there was quite a new person on presentation had no idea what to do. So when the program finished, the live presenter in between just said, you know, and now to the football, which actually made it worse. Or what you know, or the snooker, or something. So it made it worse. Nobody said, "Ah ha, that was great drama from whatever." They just pretended nothing had happened. So it it made it even worse. So yeah, so all that was going on during the night. Um, also, the TV technicians 
were watching it on the screens in the middle of um, uh, in, in the foyer in the BBC where they show all the channels and they were going, oh, my God, what's happening in Studio 2? Which, of course, there was nothing happening in Studio 2. Um, so, so that all went on the night. And then the next week was just tabloid mayhem um, where they were very angry. But everybody was very angry. The press were very angry uh, at most at uh, every stage, really. They were angry that the auntie had broken faith with the nation. BBC had, had told a lie. So for you personally, kind of what are you, what are your thoughts on, on the way it was received? I mean, talking about people losing faith and, and being upset and the phone lines being jammed. I, obviously, that, that didn't help. But what was kind of your what's kind of your personal reaction to everything that, that went on surrounding it? A uh, slight confusion. <laughs> Um, I mean, Steve and I were, sort of were marvelled at the fact that nobody saw it as a drama. It, you know, initially nobody looked at it as drama at all because there was it was the genuine comment about you know can you believe everything you see on television? And we thought we thought that maybe we'd get away with entertaining people and maybe they'd be confused for the first ten minutes or something. But we didn't realise that you know a lot of people were confused right to the end or bought it i mean there's there's such varying reactions um and also there was a tendency i think because apparently um i didn't go to, to go to it but there's a there was a program called bite back where the public are allowed to talk about programs that are made and ruth went and she said that you know half half of the time they were saying they thought it was great and half of it they were complaining about it of course the only bit that was aired was the complaints so i don't know i i don't know i don't know we don't we you know for for ages people used to come up to us and confess that they like ghost watch but nobody would ever say it out loud it was almost like you weren't allowed to say it well, and the the way that the BBC treated it for a, a decade, <laughs> you know, almost was it two decades? Um, you know that that didn't help either. No, no, not um, at all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, essentially making sure it it never uh, it, it never saw the light of day for you know almost you know two decades after it came out. Yeah, yeah. Was, well, I guess it was what is it? It was uh, twelve years. So after the tenth uh, on its tenth anniversary. Um, the BFI published DVDs, TV classics, and someone tipped them off that Ghostwatch was uh, was to be watched. Um, they didn't know what it was. They, you know, I phoned them up. Someone tipped me off that BBC, the BFI, the British Film Institute, were going to publish the DVD. So I phoned them up and said, "Do you want Stephen and I to come in and do like a, you know, a director and writer and?" And they said, "Oh yeah, if you if you want to." So that um, you know, so it was still it was still fairly obscure and um, and buried. I mean, it had its it had an unofficial website and a and a strong following, but all underground. So yeah, so the DVD was the DVD was published ten years, and that that had a five year run or something like a two year run, and then they stopped, and then there was a blank period again, and then I think I think uh, one hundred one sort of took it up um but bbc had never shown it again so that was something that steven spoke with me about and i'm, I'm kind of curious if this has happened to you as well a lot of people my age who saw it when they were kids yeah really have a had a positive reaction to it yeah 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 versus adults yeah. Have, have you kind of noticed the same thing well, yeah, it's really interesting because I had a one-year-old child when I directed this, and um, I had a nanny for the one-year-old child, <laughs> um, and her. This is a this sounds like a shaggy dog story. Her mother was a teacher for eight-year-olds, and they were completely obsessed with it. And they were in Sheffield, um, in a in a in a um, state school. Uh, and um, they started, the, I started this massive long correspondence with these eight-year-old children. And they, their letters are hilarious. Um, and they just take it, they, I don't know, they just, they take it more, like they make believe that they is so much more sophisticated than adults. I think adults felt wronged on behalf of everybody else, whereas the kids really um, had fun with it. Well, they certainly did with these letters. And I used to, I wrote back and sort of told them how it was all done and the rest of it. But yeah, so I've got about... 40 letters from eight-year-olds who seem to really enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, that's what Stephen talked with me about was kind of adults feeling like the trust had been broken and they couldn't trust the BBC, which, okay. Yeah, yeah I think, do you know what I think it's, from, from my point of view in retrospect, 
I really think it's to do with the lang- the language that I used. So because just because I kept it quite clean and uh, in the sense I clean to TV language. I mean, I did break my own rules a couple of times because uh, technically it wouldn't it couldn't have been done what I was trying to do if I'd been totally purist. But I do think that people read unsubconsciously, especially then. I think so audiences are more sophisticated now, but then they they would read the camera language and and see, and see it as truth in the same way that we used to see, you know, handheld running around as documentary. Obviously, we don't now, but do you see what I mean? So I think mm-hmm. I think that's the arena we were in. <laughs> So let, let's talk a little bit about kind of the the legacy of Ghostwatch. Kind of for you personally, what has the legacy of Ghostwatch been for you? Yeah, I think it. I think it has had quite a big influence. I mean, obviously, it's nice to think that it's had a big influence. Um, but you know, Blair Witch came out after it. Um, you know, paranormal activity uh, always sort of gives a nod to us. He talks about Ghostwatch um, as inspiration. Um, um, I, I think we were, I suppose, in reality, I think we were at the beginning of something, that's for sure. Um, whether we were instrumental, I don't know. But we. I think, you know, we were definitely at the beginning of, think, of something because language was changing. It was... Stephen and I watched quite a bit of reality TV or, you know, or factual TV to, to to get on top of the language as we were before we went into production. And it was very interesting what was happening, you know, in the the war footage that was coming back in 91 had music on it, which I, for me was almost immoral. Um, uh, um, there was there was a, a program that we had on air called 999, which was totally dramatized, which was factual stories, but totally dramatized. Um, maybe with sometimes without actors, but you know, lots of POV, lots of blood, lots of um, fakery. So the crossover was happening all over the place, you know. And I just think we were right at the beginning of the dramatic crossover. And. For your career, how has how has Ghostwatch affected your personal career? Well, I, I, don't, I actually <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Stephen and I are uh, trying to. Uh, we've nearly got there, but we're looking the last bit of money for our next for the for the for the next piece that we want the, the next feature that we want to make. Um, I don't know. Stephen and I was sl- we. It was there was for at least for a few years. People were really we were slightly buried. That's for sure. Um, uh, by the BBC, anyway. Um, you mean like black? Yeah, person? definitely. Well, maybe you can't say definitely, but yeah, people are a bit nervous. Um, you know, you think that's because of the reaction of the public or the reaction of the public to the BBC? I think it's the reaction of the public, and they didn't know how to handle it. So that's what always strikes me as odd about Ghostwatch and the way that the BBC had... It's always strange to me that the BBC didn't think that the reaction was going to be what it was. It's always just kind of strange to me that they didn't think that people were going to kind of lose it over it, especially with the phone number at the bottom and trying to present it as reality. Well, it's interesting because... Uh, Richard Brooke, who was a fantastic executive producer, he and Ruth, I think they knew the potential of it. Um, and he, they, uh, the BBC was is was a, a huge organisation and quite cumbersome because of it. And they have these. R- Richard Brooke explained to me these. This is part of the BBC I know nothing about as a director, but um, he explained that they had meetings every week, and if there was a controversial program or controversial anything, you know, you could raise it and discuss it. And um, he described before he passed away. Uh, he described to us about how he tried to bring up. You know, I've got Ghostwatch, this thing, and they just go, oh, yeah, yeah, Richard, yeah, yeah, we all know your programs are great. And and so so there was a – he said that nobody wants to know. Nobody wanted to know. So even though he tried to bring it up, nobody wants to, to, to hear what he was talking about. I don't think anybody actually – I just don't think they knew and they knew how it was going to go. And I do, he sent me some correspondence, which I thought was really interesting, where he'd shown it to someone and they just thought that I'd got it completely wrong, that there was no drama in it. They did, they absolutely didn't understand the reality element. They just thought I'd basically messed up 
um, because the actors didn't seem like they were acting, you know, all this sort of stuff. They didn't get the style of it at all. So I think they were just, I just think they were wrong footed. Um, But also I don't, you know, it's a huge organisation. I don't think anyone sort of took responsibility, I suppose. I don't know. I don't know. It's easier to blame the filmmakers. And the the screenwriter, I guess. It's kind of the way I've always looked at it. Yeah, so. always blame the one out of the room. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's the easiest one because the one out of the room can't defend yeah, itself. Yeah. Are you a fan of the horror genre? And and if you are a fan of the horror genre, what are your thoughts on kind of f- the found footage genre that seems to have you know some inspiration from Ghost Watch, at least admittedly and not admittedly in some respects? Um, I I think I yeah I'm I, I I'm the, I'm a, a fan of uh, the horror genre in a in a uh, I'm not. I don't particularly like um, blood and too much um, guts and gore. I don't go that way. But I love the. I do love the thrill and the and the psychological tension. And you know, I love that that side of stuff. Uh, I actually really enjoyed Paranormal Activity, especially one. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember uh, Jaws was a big <laughs> had a big impression on me as a as a as a young watcher so i yeah i do like i do like i do like to come out i do like that sort of suspension of you know uh, I, I like to be thrilled i like that cathartic ride i like it yeah All right, so we are back and we are finishing up talking about Ghost Watch. So, Mike, I am curious since, you know, we've kind of talked horror movies in the past. I'm kind of curious your thoughts just in general on the found footage horror subgenre, because I think a lot of people really have like a preconceived notion of it. And that's kind of the point of this month is to maybe change some preconceived notions about the quality of found footage horror. Well, I think that filmmakers who play with the conventions who know how to make things look like they were real and then go from there, those are the ones who do it the most successfully. Too often, if I'm watching found footage stuff, and I hate the term found footage because it has changed over the years, found footage used to literally be stuff that you would find in a dumpster and then re- re- reuse it, like stuff like Bruce Connor, you know, filmmakers from the, the, the 50s and 60s or, or even earlier would repurpose footage, and that was truly found footage. So this faux reality, and I know it's a losing battle for me to call it anything other than found footage, but this, this new found footage style – uh, new as of uh, through what thirty years ago now we're going on <laughs> with this stuff and you can well more than that because technically I don't know Eric where do you start found footage at I start found footage ho- I start found footage films in general at Can- Cannibal Holocaust yeah that's about where I would start I mean what we would consider when somebody says found footage now um, chances are you're talking about a found footage horror movie and I, that's like the first one so um yeah that's where i would start it and then like you know like we've been talking about like this is i mean it's sort of weird to put ghost watch in the found footage category because it like kind of is and kind of isn't it's like faux documentary it's like faux something totally different there was like a fake live broadcast like that they put on fucking like cable on prime time on a Saturday night or some shit on Halloween. Like it's insane to me, like the level that they went to for this, this isn't just like, you know, Blair witch project, like getting shown, you know, in a bunch of theaters across the country. And like, you know, we know that it's not real because you're going to the goddamn movie theater to watch it. Like, uh, it's weird, man. It's a totally different, it's interesting. And I think, yeah, I don't know. Found footage. I, I really like it, and when it's done well, it's really effective. But honestly, this takes it to a whole nother level that's, like, totally different than any other found footage, like, horror movie that we can talk about, I think. The thing with found footage movies that always drives me a little crazy is when I watch these things and there's just no grasp on reality so that I watch a found footage movie and I just start thinking to myself, well, how did this get edited? Who sat down and put this together? Who did the sound mixing on this? How come there are multiple cameras here? Those are the ones that are always unsuccessful to me, are the ones where I can't 
find myself inside of the story and I just immediately start asking those questions. And there's just, there's too many of those. I, it was the simple s- stuff like the VHS movies where I just watch and I go, well, this was never on a VHS tape. Why are you calling this VHS? They put a VHS tape into a machine. This is not VHS. Why am I watching this? And it just immediately, you know, everything is completely gone. And then I start asking those questions like, who put this together? Who edited this? How come there's multiple things? Who's doing the lighting? All of this kind of stuff. So it takes a lot for me to get invested into a found footage movie so the ones that do it successfully really stand out for me as being something a cut above the rest where i'm not second guessing all of these things and ghost watch is one of those ghost watch sets it up so well as far as you know here are where the cameras are we're going to show you here's camera one here's camera two here's camera three okay now we're going to go through the house now we're going to talk about the audio now we're going to talk about this and just to set up all of those things is really smart and yeah i would say that this falls somewhere between found footage and mockumentary but again mockumentary is another one of those things where if they do it right then you don't question stuff and ghost watch definitely does it right well and the thing is and we've talked about this obviously fair amount now but with something like ghost watch the conceit is baked into it. right you have a frame of reference of what this is even as americans this is a british you know a british tv show a british broadcast you know even as americans we understand what this is supposed to be and my issue has always been with found footage is the conceits are always so goofy because it's just not reality. Like you said, who's editing this? Who is, well, yeah, why didn't TJ Miller put the camera down in Cloverfield? Q Eric saying, people are going to want to see this. Um, which you, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's one of those things where the conceits sometimes just don't work right. at all. And in this, it's baked into it. In the film we watched on the last pot, on the last culture cast, the conspiracy, the conceit, gets played with, at the end, the thing about who's editing this, which I think works in tremendous fashion. I'm assuming you'd agree with me, Eric. Um, Oh, yeah, they totally flip it on its head. Yeah, they take something in the conspiracy where you would think it was working in one direction, and they completely flip it, and it's working sort of against the initial idea of the filmmakers. Um, Yeah, and that's... I mean, that's one of those movies where, again, like I never questioned like why the cameras were there or how it was edited or why it was shot or like, you know, what these guys were doing or how it was finished. Like, I, I never worried about that because it was all just shown to me. It was all right there. It was everything was spelled out um, without having to like have a title card that said like, you know, that happens in a lot of horror movies is they'll have a title card at the beginning of the movie or at the end of the movie that says like, uh, we found I think it's actually at the beginning of the Blair Witch Project where they're like, we found X amount of tapes and we edited together. Like somebody edited together the footage just to like cut it down for time. Other than that, like we have not tampered with it at all. And then they show you the edited together thing. Like I know for a fact that's like in a bunch of like that's in uh, some of the paranormal activity movies. It's in uh, Blair Witch Project. It's in a bunch of those movies where I'm just like, okay, so you just edited together hours and hours and hours of footage to like create a narrative. And then like, you're like, oh, but then after that, we didn't touch it. Like we didn't tamper with it at all. So like, here you go. Um, Yeah, those, uh, I don't know. Those are like a lot less believable and you really have to like just be on board with the format in general before you even watch those. Um, but I think things like ghost watch and things like, um, the conspiracy, like if you're more skeptical or don't like, you know, the format of found footage, um, those make it much more believable and much easier to just like go with it and well, not and the think too hard about found it. Footage is- we're more accustomed to VHS or Blair Witch or Paranormal Activity or a a lot of these movies. We're more accustomed to those than Ghost Watch or The Conspiracy or WNUF Halloween Special, which does, which kind of apes Ghost Watch um, a lot in in a good way, in a really good way, but it, it does kind of the same things in a way, but in a different format. 
And that's what I find to be most successful about found footage, like we've been talking about, is when it doesn't just play to the conventions straight. And I mean, look at what happened with that Blair Witch movie that came out, what, two years ago? No, who give that movie was awful. And it just goes to show you can't replicate that lightning in a bottle. Success. I mean, honestly, I think that movie's biggest problem, like not to completely change the subject to Blair Witch from a year ago, two years ago. Anyways, whenever it came out, um, was that movie looked super cool up until they were that it was Blair Witch. Like, they should have just left it at whatever the original title was, like when the first trailer dropped for it, um, and not told anybody that it was a Blair Witch movie until you went and saw it. And if you went and saw it, and then like halfway through the movie, they're like, oh yeah, this is about a Blair Witch thing. Or like, you know, I don't know, in the movie, I think it's like five or ten minutes in, they're like, oh yeah... Um, my sister was the one who got lost or some shit. But if you figure out by watching the movie that it's a Blair Witch movie, I think that movie would have been way better. And well, it comes back I'm, to something like yeah, Ghost where they just don't. I mean, tell Ghost you. Watch doesn't outright. Yeah, they don't outright tell you that this is not right. fake, or they don't. They don't outright tell you that this isn't real. They let you kind of come to the conclusion on your own, or completely buy into the idea that it's real. And I think that that's the most successful way to watch this is to buy into it and not be like, "Well, I can see the." Effect or this effect looks cheap or something like that. I'm not saying anything sure. does, but just saying that and kind of buying into it, you'll enjoy this more than if you're like nitpicking it for, you know, the effects looking dated or God knows what's, you know, you know, kind of you could pick this. Yeah. Up for. I actually kind of liked some of the, the badness of this, like when uh, they turn on a light and the auto iris turns on and suddenly it's all blown out and then it comes back down and closes down. It's like, oh yeah, that was part of the deal when it came to some of these cameras. And just like seeing the artifacts of time, I thought was kind of a nice uh, effect to it. Uh, oh yeah. The And that, that's the thing, this was made in 92. This isn't like what we're watching next on the next Culture Cast or two Culture Casts from now, WNUF Halloween Special, which is recreating a broadcast mm. from the 80s. This is filmed in the 90s. So like you said, Mike, it's got all those kind of little kind of things that you would expect. And it works in its favor because it just it's just another it's just another drop in the bucket of selling you yeah. on what this is. It doesn't look super polished. It, it's not, you know, it's not, you know, the high quality production. Production values. It's meant to look this way because in looking that way, it sells exactly what it is. Yeah, they shot the whole thing like on videotape instead of like on film. And so the aspect ratio is all square and made for TV and not widescreen or anything like that. And it feels it just makes it feel more real. It makes it feel like, you know, shit that was coming out in the early 90s or whatever. Because for all intents and purposes, it is. And it was like it's just because it was fake doesn't mean that like they made it fake. Like they made it like they would make any other TV show, but they just did it with a film crew and did it ahead of time. <laughs> them committing to this 100% is why I love this so much. Like, because they committed to it. Absolute commit commitment to what they were trying to create. That's why this works so well for me. Is because they really, like, they really committed to the entire idea. And they didn't have anything that didn't mesh well with trying to create a television broadcast. And that's, that's why this really stands out and stands the test of time. And has kind of bridged the gap and come over to the United States and is on Shutter and was on Shutter's front page last year for like eight months when they first got it on Shutter because it was I think it's something that anyone who's a horror fan should watch because obviously as an American horror fan I didn't hear about it until it was on Shutter because it wasn't a thing in this country we have our own version of this it was the War of the Worlds broadcast but this is a different this is a different beast entirely but not but not in a way that we can't relate to in 2018 I'm not sure I could really relate to the War of the Worlds broadcast in 2018 yeah that would be very like, at, at all yeah I don't know it would be it would be tough but if you could pull it off like then hell yeah well those mediums have changed so much I mean and that's the thing too with this being in 92 you know i'm saying we had a limited number of channels and it was maybe not that way in the u.s or definitely starting to not get that way in the u.s so this was a product of its time as well as far as in a few years hence once they started to introduce uh you know cable and and satellite and stuff to the uk you 
couldn't necessarily do something like this because you had more channels, you lost your audience. It's kind of like, you know, going back to the War of the Worlds, that was the prime time for radio, and that was when radio was the thing, and when there were only so many channels like you you could get in at that point. So, you know, you listened to War of the Worlds, or you maybe listened to one or two other things, but the majority of people were tuned into that particular broadcast that particular night. Otherwise, it wouldn't have had any of its power. Because they could do something like this now, throw it on a channel. Who knows if you're going to see it? You know, especially a live broadcast. Yeah, forget about it. Oh yeah, it have to be on like right. Facebook or YouTube or Snapchat. It would. Yeah, it would have to be like it would have to be like a live. Yeah, you'd have to do like this is Facebook, like on Facebook Live. And you know what? I think that would be so interesting to see if someone could pull off something like this in 2018 on like Facebook Live. So like you'd have to have like everything kind of ready to go and like I think I I don't know if you could pull it off. I think it would be a monumental undertaking, but if you did, I think it would be similar to Ghostwatch. People would be talking about it for years to come. They'd be like, "Holy shit, this is nuts that you could pull this off." Yeah. Yeah. It's like, "Oh my god. Wow." Well, the, the other thing to Eric's point as far as you know, there was that movie, I don't know if it came out and went already or not, the one called Searching with John Cho where it's all from like his computer screen and yeah. you know, interacting, looking for his kid and stuff. And it's like, yeah, you're, this is all shot to look like it's on a computer screen, but yet I'm going to the movies and watching this. It just doesn't make sense. Like, I don't even right. want to see that. If I get an opportunity to see it, I don't want to see it on my television set. I would rather sit with it on my screen so it looks like it's my screen and experience that way. Yeah, yeah, it's it's that movie took the format to a really interesting place and I I want to see more weird things like I that. Want to see them presented like, as reality. Right, I want to see them presented on like an actual like make it so that the only way that you can watch it is like on your computer or phone or iPad or whatever. Like you, I know that like you want to have a big outing and you know, it being in theaters and stuff and you're going to make more money that way potentially and things like that. But I, maybe there's a different way to do it. You know, maybe you can format it differently to where if you have it as a live broadcast or you have it as something that's, you know, like up on, you know, Facebook or YouTube or whatever, Whatever, and you can get money different ways, like through advertising or um, I don't know, uh, what, however people make Maybe money, money on the, the internet. Money <laughs> after, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, or something. You got a live broadcast and everything like that, and then maybe afterwards, like people can buy the, you know, you can buy it from your website or off iTunes or whatever the fuck. But like to have a movie like that and then show it in a format that it's obviously not meant to play on is definitely weird. Yeah. Yeah, like the the whole Blair Witch thing is like I love the Blair Witch Project, and I think it's a great and effective uh, horror movie, and like one of the better like found footage movies of like the last I don't know twenty years or whatever you know however long it came out. Um, but I honestly think it like suffers from like movie theater itis. It was like one of those things like where you go and you see it at the movie theater, and you know it's not real because you're sitting at the movie theater. And that movie would have been so much scarier if it was like a VHS tape that like got passed around or whatever and copied a bunch of times. And like your friend gave it to you in college and was like, yo, you got to watch this. This shit's crazy. I got it from a friend of a friend of my cousins or whatever. And he says it's real. And then you watched it like you were fucking shat your pants. But and Blair you Witch can't is make still money doing it that way. So I don't know. Because of the budget. So they yeah. are laughing all the way to the bank, except for the fact that everyone who was involved with that movie did nothing of value since. <laughs> So, sorry. That's the problem with something like the Blair Witch. It's it's. I w- watch. I've watched Blair Witch a handful of times, and I don't think it holds up to repeat viewings. Not like this. Not like the conspiracy. Not like WNUF. I just don't think it holds up. And I think that that's the other thing about a found footage horror movie. Or and I think that found. I I agree with you, Mike. And just sitting here thinking about it, it should really be more reality horror, not found footage. Because found footage is just like Eric said that title card at the beginning. We found this somewhere. Like that's. Fucking- and sometimes you can go through so many goddamn backflips to explain yourself like fucking chronicle it's like really you can levitate the camera now and now you're taking the cameras up into the atmosphere when you're flying around like superheroes they went through so many things to try to make that 
found footage work through the entire so thing. Yeah, it's That's a terrible the thing. Movie. It's, when you have something like this, the conceit makes sense. When you have something like The Conspiracy, the conceit makes sense. When you have something like Cannibal Holocaust, the conceit makes sense. Yeah. I'm not saying that Cannibal Holocaust is a good movie because it's not. It's it's really not. It's not only do they actually kill an animal on screen, it's also just not a good movie. Like it's not entertaining. It's boring and the payoff is I mean the I don't know. The payoff is pretty brutal. Like, I think even now, like, a lot of the visual effects from that movie still hold up better than a lot of other well, visual it, the, effects I've seen. When the seen visual effects are done shit, on a, a shoestring budget, there is something to be said. Yeah. For yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's Ver- versus like, CGI. That movie wasn't supposed to be entertaining. It was supposed to be a documentary, and it was, it succeeded in being a boring documentary where, like, the ending definitely takes a hard left turn. Yeah, it's very interesting. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a movie called The Last Broadcast. It actually came out about maybe eight months before the Blair Witch and it was almost the exact same thing it was like totally a found footage horror movie and you follow this guy around eventually the guy who's making the documentary ends up spoilers being the killer but it's really effective and it was one of the first movies to be satellite broadcast to different theaters. They were trying all these different things to kind of make a name, and then it just got shuffled right by when it came to history. And it's like Blair Witch comes out, you know, middle of 99, and nobody ever talks about the last broadcast, but it is so super similar. And then also I wanted to give a shout-out to Man Bites Dog, which also – uses this whole idea of the making of a documentary and all of these horrible things going on. And that movie is absolutely terrific. It's blood curdling and hilarious all at the same time. And that was 93. So it was the, by the time I saw Blair Witch, I was like, okay, I've seen this kind of stuff before. It was still effective and everything. I still remember the image of the kid staring at the corner, but that's pretty much all I remember from that movie is just that one image. So it's like, eh, okay. It was hilarious when I was working at Blockbuster that fall people would come in they'd be like did you see Blair Witch Project I mean like, yeah that was the worst piece of shit I've ever seen and just like going off like they it was that uh, effect that you're talking about uh, Chris when it comes to the reaction of people who got fooled by uh, Ghost Watch it was that same thing of like I got fooled into watching this movie but it was more like I got fooled because people kept telling me how how uh, scary it was and then they would go see it and they'd be like it was way too overhyped for them already, and they just didn't see why it was scary. Well, and that's the thing about Blair Witch that Ghost Watch doesn't suffer from. And I know we've talked a lot about Blair Witch with Ghost Watch, but again, there's no way the people who made Blair Witch had never seen Ghost Watch. Mm. I, just, I, I can't, I cannot fathom that that's a reality, regardless of how many times the people who made Blair Witch say that that's the case. That's totally not the case. I, unless it's, you know, what is that thing about how Amy Schumer claims she didn't steal anyone's jokes, like uh, parallel thinking or, or whatever lie she came up with to claim that she wasn't ripping people off 100% by saying the exact same thing. Um, I mean, they didn't rip off Ghost Watch, but... I mean, ripoff is too strong of a term. With Blair Was Witch, it an homage? Yeah, yeah what is it? Uh, ripping it off is this, uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. With something like Ghostwatch, it's, I think with Blair Witch, the reason that I, like, people say that is because it's not even really entertaining. This is at least entertaining. This holds your attention for 90 minutes. Blair Witch, there's a lot of shit where it's just like they're just walking in the woods and like one character is screaming at another one. You've got in this, you've got like and I think it helps that it's this mixed medium where you've got characters going back and forth and like, you know, switching to the studio and then to the house and then to Craig Charles running around on the street. Like you've got this kind of ensemble cast. And I think that that also really helps with Ghostwatch kind of not only be effective, but also be unsettling because you're never really in the same spot for very long, and you're getting to see characters' reactions. That's the thing. Blair Witch exists inside of a vacuum, right? You never get to see your own reaction to Blair Witch. In Ghost Watch, you're seeing Michael Parkinson react to what's going on with Sarah Green in the house. You feel for Mike Smith because that's his wife, and you feel for his character because she is going through all this in the house, and you're seeing his reaction. But in Blair Witch, it's happening in a vacuum. It's us watching it, and, you know, what are we That's a very good point. And yeah, that back and forth between studio and host 
and even the different parts of the studio, the different parts of the house, you know, the little studio that they have, the man on the street reporter who's running across that park and everything. That's really nice that we have so many different places and so many actions from all of these different characters. When you have like a film like Digging Up the Marrow, another you know, reality horror film. And that's that movie is successful for the similar reasons that Ghost Watches. You get to see people's reactions. And in and of itself, that might not seem like much, but it helps sell the reality of this. And it's it's a lot and it, and I think it's more fun because it sells the reality. So well um Mike, what would you give Ghost Watch out of five? I'd give it a four out of five. Eric, what about you? Damn, solid and decisive answer. Immediate. He knew. Um yeah, I'm gonna give it uh I'm gonna give it a four out of five as well. I think like the only thing holding it back from like being something like singular and perfect um even considering you know like the time and um you know just restraints as to like what you could do in 1992 and make it seem real and like a live broadcast for television i like if you can somehow just fix the hokiness at the very end of the movie like (laughs) with all the cats and shit um and like the wind and stuff like i mean i think other than that it's uh it's perfectly executed like i can find very little at fault with this yeah, I'm going to give it a four and a half out of five. I think it's a lot of fun. It's one of those found footage films, reality horror mockumentaries that I tell people I know who go, oh, found footage fucking sucks. Which, by the way, if you bring up found footage horror to someone, they will undoubtedly say that. And if you're talking about films like Paranormal Activity and the nine sequels it spawned, I'd be inclined to agree with you. But when you've got these really interesting, fun, genre-bending things like Ghost Watch, I would disagree. Found footage doesn't suck. That's just like saying, oh, action movies suck based off of only watching Steven Seagal action movies. Oh, man. Those are Biden words against Steve. Mm. <laughs> Fire Down Below is not exactly an American film classic. So, well, uh, let's take our final break and we'll play a preview for the next Culture Cat. Testing one, two, three. We're on. We're here to investigate a patient that killed three innocent teenagers on a Halloween in 1978. He was shot by his own psychiatrist and taken into custody that night. And has spent the last 40 years in captivity. Hello, Michael. I have something you might like to see. Everyone in my family like turns into a nutcase this time of year. Yeah, I mean your grandmother is Lori Strode. She was almost murdered. Wasn't it her brother who murdered all those babysitters? No, it was not her brother. That's something that people made up. Do you know that I pray every night that he would escape? Who the hell did you do that for? So I can kill him. Dad, look out! The bus crashed. Mom, what bus crashed? Michael escaped. Excuse me, somebody's in here. Hello? He's waited for this night. He's waited for me. I've waited for him. Get out! Go home! Get inside! in the boogeyman. He's here! Michael! You should. Can you close the closet door? (laughs) 
That's right. On the next Culture Cast, we are going to be talking about Halloween 2018. Yes, we have to use that moniker now because the films have the same name. Until then, however, what have you been up to, Mike? Where can people find the Projection Booth podcast? Well, before I get into that, I've just been making a YouTube video where I've been complaining that they use the same title. And now I have to say Halloween 2018 or Halloween 1978. And it's just not fair. It's just not fair. <laughs> I'm oh my god well I can tell you it's easy for you to sleep sleep soundly at night because little preview for our next culture cast the original is oh, still better but now I have to discern it when people ask me what my favorite movie is and I say Halloween and they'll say which one or they'll think that I mean the 2018 version I'm gonna leave nasty our comments house doesn't the hire female directors because I, he doesn't I mean, know that any exists uh, you could be talking about um, the oh 2007 god. Rob Zombie masterpiece Halloween exactly no <laughs> he's not joking Mike. uh i'm not joking when i talk about the 2009 masterpiece that is rob zombie's halloween 2 because that movie is absolutely batshit insane and amazing i have yet to have the courage to watch it after watching that first rob it's, zombie halloween Oof. it's so much worse it's so much more brutal and sickening to watch and then it's weird as fuck on top of it so it's like Everything that the first Halloween movie should have been, but like they just they're like, yeah, fuck it. We'll do it in the second one. It's fine. We'll do it live. We'll do it live. God damn it. We'll do it live. And you know what? And you know what? Rob Zombie may not be an auteur, but he does know how to make a really grisly horror movie in the vein of like early Toby Hooper. True. So. Yeah. So much so that the new Halloween movie, in my opinion, the new Michael Myers is has taken a many cues from Rob Zombie's Michael Myers. Agreed. So, uh, where can people find you, Mike? You can find me over at projectionboothpodcast.com, where every week, every GD week, I am putting out a new episode of the show that I've been doing for going on eight years now, I guess it is. And, uh, yeah. What? We're in the middle of a shock October 2018. Oh, yeah, and, um, brother. <laughs> just, <laughs> just about to release an epic uh, discussion of Chinese hopping vampires. And then we wrap things up na- next week talking about Session 9 with David Caruso. Ooh, I love Session 9. That was a lot of fun to put together. Ooh, Session 9 is great. I'm going to have to fucking tune in for that it, one. So. Ooh. Ooh, you should watch it. And then we can listen to the podcast together. Oh, wow. Ooh, in we the can sauna? Hold hands. I mean, what? In the sauna? <laughs> in the dry sauna. Uh, the sauna brother. that is my oh, pants. Uh, where can people find you, Eric? Um, you can find me uh, at uh, the local um, uh, alcohol dispensing place. Uh, any one of the fine establishments that is by my house. I'm still not on the internet. Um, so, yeah, I was... I was so... Yeah, so much so that you were at a, fr- a mutual friend of ours wedding, and I didn't even see any pictures of you on Facebook at his wedding. Yeah, uh, the Facebook algorithm Hiding doesn't even know what to somewhere. do with me anymore because there's no reference material for it to, like, grab from. So, yeah. You're off the grid. Yeah, come and, come and find me in real life. We'll have a real-life discussion about um, things that happen on the Internet that I don't know about. Well, and as always, you can find me on Twitter at Culture Stash. You can find out more about the Culture Cast over at CultureCast.com. You'll find links over to iTunes where you can rate and review the show, which you should totally do. And to Patreon where you can kick a couple dollars our way if that's a thing you want to do. I'm not going to tell you to do it, but we sure would appreciate it. Donors get access to some kind of cool stuff, so you should go check that out. Big thanks to Eric for kicking out a really cool, moody as fuck intro outro song, and to Mike for joining us for one of two appearances. I'm looking time. forward to some WFUN. Jesus. <laughs> oh, man. And we'll that see was you on awesome. the next culture. Thank you. Guys.